Hey there. First, I want to acknowledge that everything kind of sucks right now, and I really hope that you are doing okay in light of the current outbreak and the and just general changes to life that are happening as response to it. That out of the way, I also want to let you know that we have decided to make some of our favorite content from 2019 that was uh, on our Patreon uh, actually free for everybody. Uh, if you are a subscriber to the WAF public feed, you probably saw four episodes drop uh, earlier this week. Um, those are just for you. They're for everybody. It's just, we're calling it the quarantine pack. It's an episode of Epic Suffering. Uh, it's an episode of Adaptation Decay. It's an episode of um, uh, Unfilmable. And then our premium Watch Out for Fireballs about Bioshock Infinite. Uh, go ahead and grab those. Please enjoy them. Please stay safe. Stay indoors. Socially distance, flatten the curve, all of that. Yeah, no, that's that, that, that's all. Just enjoy those and enjoy this episode. Thank you. This is Gary Butterfield. This is Cole Ross. And you're listening to Watch Out for Fireballs Dispatch, our monthly Q&A listener response episode announcement <laughs> podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's just a general catch-all, you know, see how you're doing kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so we're going to be reading your uh, questions and responding to your uh, discussion prompts. We've got our topic suggestion uh, that we're going to uh, be, be talking about, and then we're going to uh, read your responses to March's games uh, you know, Indeed. Valda Story, Axiom Verge, and Ocarina of Time. And announcing May. Yeah. Just letting you guys know there will be a May. Yep. <laughs> in case in case you're thinking there was not going to be a May. Uh, I, do, uh, in any other week, that would have been a fun joke. May might be canceled. <laughs> yep. It's time, it may not. Mm. Um, the, um, may not. Yeah. It is, uh, it's plague time. It, yep. Mm. everybody we're recording in plague time san did, francisco just like did like general lockdown cool. everything is fucking wild yeah I, you know i not, not to waste tons of time on this stuff but uh -huh. how fucking surreal is it to be alive right now it's um it's like, yeah ah! <laughs> <laughs> no I, the, the, I you know i've been i've been tweeting a lot about this because i have feelings specifically about the way we're being failed by our federal government Local governments are picking up the slack, but like it's it's like the DM decided to engage hell mode. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. We we thought we, we were running like a you know we, we were running a you know not necessarily like apocalypse you know, world kobolds, but it's the tomb of horse. Yeah, exactly. So I mean, yeah, just the, yeah. there was a module swap part way through. Like, guess what, motherfuckers. Yeah. Yeah, yep. so you know it's all ten foot poles. It's TPK time. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it just it is very surreal to be alive at this time. I uh, yeah. I I honestly don't know that I ever expected it would be like this. You know, even no. even in my like more like cynical kind of kind of days where I where where I was kind of just more pessimistic about things broadly. It's just a mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. go go yeah. ahead. My mama never told me there'd be decades like this. <laughs> I just, you know, like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely like surreal is one word for it. Absolutely. Anxiety inducing harangitude. Yeah. Is another phrase for it. Like it's, it's, it's wild. Time, it's also like, it, it's like, like, it's, it is surreal specifically in this dissociative kind of way. And we've only been talking about talking about this topic for two minutes. So we're fine. But like, I, I will hear this stuff and it, and I, the, 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 it doesn't feel real to me. Yeah. And it's not like I'm like watching it on a television show about a particular plague. It's just like, no, that's just not the just and as every assumption about the way life in America specifically works is kind of peeled back. It's yeah. uh it's not something that I feel that I feel equipped for. Yes. Yeah. It is uh you know, so so if you're listening to this, you know, 
uh, know, know that we're, we're rooting for you. Yeah. For what that's worth. Um, you know, <laughs> ho- hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we can make quarantine a little bit better. Like, you know, hang out and clean your house or do nothing productive or do whatever you want and listen to this these episodes and all this jazz yeah we are Um, we are exceptionally lucky in many many ways for being able to live the kind of life that we lead you you and me gary mm -hmm. we're also lucky that our work is not disrupted by this so yeah yeah so far so far yeah. Done, done, done. <laughs> um, so we're, we're uh, reading your questions. Uh, if you ha- want to provide questions or prompts, the way you do that is through Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash That's how mm-hmm. you do it. Um, we'll get started here. Uh, I'll go ahead and get us get us going. Okay. Uh, here. I'm going to start with Doug. Uh, Doug says, what do you think makes a great video game villain, either from a story perspective or a mechanical perspective or both? And do you have any personal favorites? Uh, so I think that the villain has to be a match with the general story and tone of what's going on. You, you, you yeah. kind of want the villain to feel like it's part of the world that you're in. And yep. if it's, you know, if it is something like Final Fantasy VI where it's a psychotic clown, uh, the execution of that needs to be, like, specifically exquisite <laughs> in order to yeah. make up for that mismatch. Kafka would not work if he was the villain of Final Fantasy XIII. Right. Like, in a game with more text and, and spoken dialogue, Kafka mm-hmm. would be trash. It'd be too much. Like, you know, yeah. St. Luca Blight would be too much. Yeah. Right? Like, it's a, it's a thing. Like, I think the thing that makes a good villain is the same in a game makes is what makes a good villain anywhere. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, a good villain should not think they're wrong. Yeah. You know, like, a good villain should be acting because they out of righteousness because they think that they're totally right. Mm-hmm. Um, and that happens pretty rarely in video games. Yes. You know, it is hard for me to think of like the, the crusader, like the justified, you know, where's the black Panther? You know, yeah. Villain yeah. Where, 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 where's the judge from blood Meridian in video games? Yeah. 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 It doesn't happen very often. Right. So I think that's what makes a great villain. And what we round down to in the lack of that is like visual design. <laughs> like yeah. you know people like i guarantee if i were just to google like top 10 video game villains Sephiroth would be on number one on most of those lists and mm-hmm. i don't think that's earned based on his personality and place in the world yes he's a great design he mm-hmm. looks cool yes uh and and that's about what i can say so i i don't know that i have a good answer here because i think that it's something that games generally really fuck up mm-hmm. pretty badly <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 pretty rough. Um, I you know l- looking at the I'm looking at the top top list here, and we get things like uh, like Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat, or like not a good villain, l- 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 <laughs> Lechuk from Monkey Island, which like that's a cartoon. That's pretty fun. It's uh, yeah, but it's, but it's a like a, it's a Saturday yeah. morning cartoon kind of thing. It's kind of yeah. like he's like a Captain Planet villain, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, practical incarnation from Torment. Oh yeah, yeah, that's very good. That's a good, that's a really good villain, mm-hmm. you know, um, the enclave I think is a good villain in fallout Two specifically mm-hmm. like the, uh, the president, you know, yes. like the, 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 the old government. I think that's a really good villain. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I really like Walter Sullivan in silent Hill four, uh, specifically mm-hmm. because you never really see him until like the second half of the game. And you're specifically walking through a world of his creation, uh yeah. l- learning about him as he goes james he, sunderland's a good villain in silent hill 2 yeah i i, I, uh, I uh you know i considered Take. i considered making <laughs> making him that specifically because number eight here is pyramid head which is uh yeah, which is a weird a villain it's not, it's not a villain it's a it's a monster he's, <laughs> yeah. he's, he's, he's a monster the uh and then and then you end up with stuff like I mean, so it's, there's like two classes or like actually good villain. And then there's your Weskers and Sephiroths. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, this is cool. But that's it's not, you know, I don't know. I guess it's a different axes, like cool mm-hmm. versus high quality. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Like cool versus like l- literarily interesting, you know? Yes. Like, you know, like Pontus Sullivan and Aldrich are good villains, you know, in a series yes. that doesn't really have them, you know? Yeah. Well, like, Gwen's a great villain. Oh yeah, yeah. like you know, uh, kicking that can down the road to uh, to you know out of selfish means or uh, yes. selfish motivations until you lose yourself is really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so there, there there are some there are some good ones. Yeah. Uh, so generally, I think the thing that makes a great video game villain are the same things that make a great villain in like TV or a book or a movie, mm-hmm. uh, and that is something cooler than just like a cool design and badass one-liners. Yeah. Uh, so rule of cool can can take a hike. Yes. 
uh, from a, from a mechanical perspective, it's very difficult to like think about one of those. Um, ooh, the right like the like Gary from uh, from uh, Pokemon Red and Blue. Oh sure, <laughs> yeah, like hounds you the whole time. Yeah, yeah. has a similar move set. You know, things mm-hmm. like that. Like, that's a good, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. I think that, like, the same thing that makes a good villain from a mechanical perspective is the same thing that makes any boss good. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. You know, like, you know, test your skills in a way that's interesting, uh, that feels like a final exam. Do, do you think um, it's ultimately necessary to have a big, a big showdown with the villain of, the, of a game? Mm-mm. No. No. Yeah, I don't think so either. Yeah. Because then you end up with stuff like Fontaine. Yes. from the end of bioshock or whatever which is like fontaine's a pretty fun villain he's just evil for the sake of being evil yeah which is not very interesting but like then it becomes a boss fight and it's incoherent and dumb yeah, yeah. so um limo wreck writes as fans of D and baldur's gate and the divinity original sins are y'all excited uh or interested in baldur's gate 3 did you watch the intro movie and or the demo by sven vinke uh, it seemed like something I could see Gary definitely being into. Personally, as a fan of all those things mentioned above as well, I'm really interested in this. I just wanted to give you a softball, Gary. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I am very interested in it. Uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, finest RPG I've ever played from a mechanical standpoint. Um, the uh, Yeah, I'm very excited. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't think it's gaining that much from the license. Mm-hmm. Like, honestly, like, I don't necessarily, you know, like, does this need to be Baldur's Gate? Right. You know? No, if it was just, you know, I it's, don't know, Hellfrost, like <laughs> the the reckon the reckonation or whatever. Yeah. I, st- I would still be interested be- based on the devs. Uh but it does look cool. And I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um d- d- so I've not looked basically I've only seen like headlines and screenshots. Um does it does it pick up after Throne of Throne of Ball? I have I've have not been uh digging deep. The yeah. trailer, the first trailer did not seem like it. The first trailer um, was very cinematic. Right. And does not look like it's a related story. So, uh, but that I did would... not keep going. Um, I think there are more trailers and more footage and stuff that have been released, but I have not kept up with it because of my, uh, my, my being hype cucked. Like, cutting, uh, <laughs> hype, self, hype self cucked myself. on hype. Yeah. Yeah. I got self cucked on hype hype. <laughs> the um the future will make you know this time will make no sense to people in the future somebody mm-hmm. will find this mp3 and just be like self-cucked on high pipe <laughs> uh, you know <laughs> they, 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 this mad. To the plague yeah <laughs> this is like four years into the quarantine right oh no <laughs> no, no uh, four days <laughs> <laughs> like yeah yeah oh. <laughs> uh, I, like i'm excited about it i think it would be a bummer if it didn't continue the story you know, like you know like yeah. you, you talked about this and then you know it's something that i only appreciate academically but the span from Baldur's gate one through to throwing a ball where you're going from you know f- fighting fighting rats to being a god seems yeah. amazing to me um it's and... very hard to go keep going from there right. like throwing a ball you are I mean, it, it's big. It's big time. Right. Like, it's like 30th level D&D shit. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what happens after that. Right. And nobody does. Yeah. So, and I think it's a little bit like you finish playing um, Dragon Age Origins and you think, fuck yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna take my take my warden and we're, we're going to go on huge adventures and stuff. And like, no, every single game after this is a different character. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I could I could see either way. But it does look cool as hell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I am, I'm very excited. Uh, like next year I get the, uh, divinity original sin, uh, board game is mm-hmm. coming out. They're still putting out that tactics game at some point, like Larian studios is the one to watch hmm. some point. Somebody needs, you know, at some point we will do divinity original sin two for, for the podcast and I'll have an excuse to get you to play it. Yeah. No, I, I want uh, to, I mean, that, that's related to a question in the lightning round actually, actually. So yeah, it'll, it'll be really fun. Cause it's a, it's a, just a wonderful game. Yeah. Um, Lewis Shaw asks, is it time to let the, when you die, you have to make your way back and reclaim what you've lost, die, and it's gone, mechanic end. I loved it in Dark Souls, and have found it in subsequent games to just be a huge pain in the ass. Uh, he says arse, but I say ass uh, <laughs> okay. on this side of the pond. Good yeah. ocean. We, we, go, um, we go to college. Yeah, from, <laughs> a, we, from H to Z. Um, I get that it's trying to uh, evince an anxiety, and it works, but if I lose all that shit uh, and it takes me so long to gain, I generally feel disheartened and think less of the game. I felt this recently in games like Hollow Knight and The Surge 2. Is it time to let this go? It's um, fun. I gen- yeah, I, don't, I generally think that, like, 
most games do not do this as well as the Soulsborne games do. Right. Um, we complained about it in Hollow Knight. Uh, and the reason why is that, like, in Hollow Knight, the stakes of what you're losing just matter, like, way less. Right. Like, Hollow Knight has that weird fucked up economy where eventually there's nothing to buy. Mm-hmm. And, like, you know, it just it doesn't. Uh, so you, you need kind of a, a very specific game around it for it to work, I think. Yeah. Um I, I I I agree with that. I think that it's not so much time for it to go away. I just have appreciated when it is articulated differently um, mm-hmm. in, you know, different things. So, like, things that we've covered for um, Bonfire Side Chat recently, Death's Gambit and Blasphemous. Both of those have versions of this, uh, of, of, of this mechanic that actually have different effects. So, like, in Blasphemous... Mm-hmm you're losing maximum MP, which matters slightly less, but it ends up like being a way to not, not really a way to punish you so much because you can just go pay to get rid of it. You know, currency matters less in that game, but like it ends up being a difficulty easing uh, kind of thing mm-hmm. because it gives you a health power up and a boss or, you know, yeah. in whatever situation you're in, in death's gambit. Um, I, 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 <laughs> I had it in my head the way that it worked there, but I remember it being different there too. You know, so I think that, yeah. like, as opposed in to Death take... Gambit, you lose Estes. Like, yes. you lose Estes charges, not your souls. You always keep your souls, though, and you can buy them back with your souls. Right, right. So oh. I think that, like, is it time for it to stop overall? I don't know. It's definitely time for it to evolve and for the stakes involved in the corpse run. Uh, you know, it, it definitely, you know, they definitely need to be modified and changed in order to better match the game that they're in. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. Yeah, it should not be included if it's uh, not being given proper questioning. Mm-hmm. You know, is what what does this add? Is this does this fit into the game? Is this like a good yeah. idea? Um, and there's like I, I am with you in the terms of like things being innovative. One of the weird things that I, I forgot about, but I started uh, playing or I like installed the surge to start really making a go at it mm-hmm. uh, yesterday. Um, was I forgot how in Lords of the Fallen there's that rare item that will summon your souls back to you. Yeah. And how good of an idea that is. Mm-hmm. You know, like as a thing, like there's a lot of design space in that that you can do more than just a simple putt. Yeah. And like Hollow Knight tried to do that. Like in mm-hmm. Hollow Knight, you fight that ghost. Then yeah. It just kind of sucks though. Right. You know, it, it didn't add a whole lot. So like it, I think it's, it's still a place for fun mechanics, but, uh, you know, make it fun and make it fit. Yes. So. 100%. Um, let's see here. Uh, Popo for show show writes, since you guys covered Ocarina of time, I was hoping that you could cover transitioning games into 3d. What is gained, what is lost and how, uh, do games uh, successfully make that transition? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, you know, and it, it does like for me, uh, this depends on a lot on kind of the focus of what the, the game is. Mm-hmm. Like if something is uh, I 10 times out of 10 with no exceptions, prefer platforming in, in 2D. Yes. Um, like I love Portal, which is kind of platforming. But I, if I'm going to do like doing precision platforming, I think it is much easier yes. when I can see my jump arc mm-hmm. from the side, like the same way I would mathematically. Um, in general, uh, you know, dodging projectiles, I think is easier in 2d because you can see behind in front of you and behind you, mm-hmm. you know, uh, things like that. I think that if I'm exploring a space and trying to get a sense of place, uh, 3d is better, even if it's like super low poly Kingsfield style, like 3d tends to have more atmosphere, yeah. uh, for me. And when you, I look at the souls likes, like I look at the, uh, that, that genre, you know, looking at a salt and sanctuary or even a death's gambit, neither of those games have the same kind of sense of place, right. You know, in term, uh, that say like a souls or even like a souls like does, yeah. uh, in a general sense. Mm-hmm. So it kind of depends on what the game is about, yeah. um, is, is a, is a preference and transitioning the, the worst thing to me that you, you can do is making that transition without taking that into account. So it's like one of the big things that salt and sanctuary drove me nuts about is all the places look the same. Everything just looked like muddy brown, and that's very key to the, exploring that game is, like, mm-hmm. making your way around and memorizing a space. So yes. they made a transition there from 3D to 2D without taking that into account. Mm-hmm. And then I think about, like, 3D platforming and how often I just miss 3D jumps because, I don't know, like, it, it doesn't seem like I think I can make it, mm-hmm. but I can't because it's harder to judge distances. Yeah, perspective is, perspective is crazy, especially when you control the camera. 
Exactly. Like it's not, so just making that transition uh, to a 3d platform requires a lot of adaptation Yeah. Uh, there. And if, the, the worst thing that happens is if you just, you know, shunt it over one-to-one basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shunting it over one-to-one making that move specifically, you know, this was a problem in the nineties, obviously you, you needed it to be in 3d because you know, it had to be you know marketable, right? Nobody wanted to mm-hmm. buy 2d games anymore. You know, go go look at that. They're like, <laughs> there's a there's a there's a uh, Twitter account that just posts things that age poorly, and it was like a side by side image comparison from like a from a game magazine talking of you know just just like pu- putting up a screenshot of Castlevania 64 versus Symphony of the Night. Yeah, <laughs> you know, just like talking about what a shame you know, the, the 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 PlayStation is falling behind. Look what the Nintendo gets, blah blah blah, which is the most wrong headed thing you could probably. <laughs> could do mm-hmm. and, you know the most wrong-headed so i you know for, for, for me the, the greatest thing that you get is the sense of scale in place um the thing that you lose is most of the time fluidity um yeah you know is uh you, you add a certain amount of clunk um and it just seems kind of like harder to do the basics in 3d so yeah, yeah. The, 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 that is the biggest thing but like that's not always the case like compare uh prince of persia sands of time to the original prince of persia you know mm. T- sands of time is like way more about dodging traps and stuff and it's way more fluid yeah 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 the fluidity definitely changes and stuff too but the original prince of persia is definitely like a precision platformer yes. that would not work in 3d no like no. that kind of like abe's odyssey Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of cinematic platformer or whatever you'd, you'd call those kind of things yeah. does not work in 3D mm-hmm. in the same way. You have to be able to measure a jump like specifically, yes. you know, so like you, you gain fluidity, but you lose precision. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like that makes ways, sense. I think. Yeah. yeah. Um, Greg asks, uh, understanding uh, that you guys game for the podcast, I was curious if what you're looking for in a game to play for pleasure has changed over the years. When I was younger, I had less games and less access to them. I really wanted a uh, tough, challenging game so they'd last a while, even if the game itself was pretty short. Now my older age, balancing a full-time job and hundreds of games in my backlog, I just want to have fun with it. Life is too short to bash my head against a wall numerous times on normal or hard mode when I can enjoy and finish the game on easy mode, for example. Some people have taken me to task for this, saying I'm not really playing the game, but uh, I'm like, if it's single player and I played for it, I can do that the fuck i want thanks yeah um, you can definitely do what the fuck you want and you're right about that yeah i i, I oof, man if somebody like gives you the business for playing it on easy i'm just yeah. maybe this is 2020 brain why the fuck do they care they're a bigger <laughs> fish to fry yeah gamers <laughs> The, like, arguably, there are bigger fish to fry, gamers. Uh, arguably, there have always been bigger fish to fry, yeah. but it's like, I don't know, for, for, for some reason, especially now. Like, arguably, you've just set fire to a house with a single sardine in it. <laughs> uh, like, gamers, this is not, you know, this is not your war. Um, the uh, Yeah, I uh, it has changed a little bit for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but not in that way. Like I, I typically still don't play things on easy unless it's, I just get really sick of something and I have to see the rest of it for the, yeah. for the show. If, uh, if I'm playing a game for funzos, uh, and I'm tempted just to pop it down to easy, like generally I'll stop playing. Mm-hmm. Not because I think that playing on easy is bad, but that hasn't changed. Uh, what has changed is that I like playing, uh, like my thing, things are like a deep tactical thing that takes a while to get into yeah. or like a roguelite that you uh, continuously iterate on Mm -hmm. is very appealing to me now and wasn't when I was younger where I would instead want something that told a very big story. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, and that has been a big way that my gaming tastes have changed. So like out with the, the final fantasies and and Zelda games and in with the bindings of Isaac and the darkest dungeons and stuff like something that's mechanically crunchy and dense and repeatable Mm -hmm. is something that my, you know, my taste have really changed in that direction. Yeah. Um, for me, I mean, just like, honestly, if I'm going to play something for fun, I like it to be a relatively short experience, you know, like I, mm-hmm. in contrast to Gary, I'm not really looking forward to, you're not looking for perpetual games to get into. I specifically mm-hmm. know that those would be holes for me. <laughs> um, yeah. and they might actually like distract from work. Um, but like, a you know, a 10 hour game that I can play over the course of a week. Cause remember like when I play games for fun, I'm also playing them to talk about on the level. So there is no fun. Ha ha. Yeah. <laughs> it is. It is an excellent trap that I have built for myself. <laughs> the, uh, 
<laughs> yeah. So so I I, I I tend to like things that are a little bit more uh, a little bit more digestible is, is is honestly more of the thing that I'm looking for. But other than that, in terms of like mechanics or you know just little, like narrative heaviness or what have you, like it's not really changed at all for me. So mm. yeah. yeah, and it, it's also something where like it. I, I've gone through phases. So like when I was a kid, it was all big epic stories full of plucky young adventures. And then I had a period for like quite a while where I was really into like short art games. Mm -hmm. Like my whole thing was, you know, hey, Proteus gone home, you know, uh, 9.3 million or whatever. Like, give me give me those games. And now I'm like a little bit less into those. I think I've, I've my pendulum has swung back towards a mechanical angle. Yeah, more crunch of things. You know, more crunch um, mm -hmm. as opposed to, I, you know, I definitely had a moment when we were covering um, Night in the Woods, which is a game I greatly admire uh, and, I, and you know, I think is excellent, mm -hmm. uh, where I thought, like, if I had played this five years ago, I would have lost my mind for it. Yeah. You know, and none of the things that felt like friction would have felt like friction to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but I've, I've definitely, like, swung back into a mechanical zone and really, really appreciating and thinking about mechanics a lot. Do you think that has not? Uh, do you think that ha that has a lot to do with your job, or do you think that's just kind of part of a general, you know, pendulum swing that would have happened anyway over the course of you know five years for you? Hard to say. Yeah, yeah. counterfactuals are hard. Yeah, very difficult. Yeah. So, but yeah, that that is uh, the way that has changed for me. Mm -hmm. so. Um, do we want to move on to uh, life questions? Yeah, let's do. We have a we have a spicy uh, listener response section, which That's may or may not surprise you, thing. depending yeah. listening, <laughs> right. uh, based on Ocarina of Time. Yes. So yeah, um, so I'll move us on here. This is an, this is an interesting question. Uh, Nicholas uh, asks um, or says, "Do either of you know about aphantasia?" Uh, they provide a definition. Aphantasia is a condition where one does not possess a functioning mind's eye and cannot vo voluntarily visualize imagery. If so, do either of you have it? I recently found out about it, and I have it. Uh, it has blown my mind. I used to think that the phrase to picture something was a metaphor, not a literal thing that people could do. I'm an avid reader and know I feel like I'm missing something out of the experience that others get uh, when they say that they get transported to the world, etc. Yeah, yeah, this, this was all over for a little bit. Yeah, so like, so it was it was this online, and then it was also people talking about um, uh, whether you know whether or not you have an internal monologue. Basically, it is a fifty percent, like a fifty yeah. percent split, depending like how, like how you think. <laughs> yeah, whether you think in words or not. Right. I I find this really uh, found this when this was going around really tricky though because like this this feels very subjective even in terms of self reporting. Yeah. To me, like, oh, you know, if I say, like, oh, I can picture an apple, do I actually see the apple? And the answer to that is, like, it's not, like, the same thing as if I'm looking at an apple. Right. You know, I can I can conjure in my mind, like, a set that is an apple. Mm -hmm. But I'm not really seeing it. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, this is, this, in the, I can... like, when this took the internet by storm, I was very surprised because I was like, boy, I don't actually understand what any of this really means in real life. Right. You know, yeah, and, like, and, yeah. like, hey, hey, Cole, picture an apple. Like, I can I can picture in kinds of apples that I have seen before. And, like, mm -hmm. at a, a, like, all at a time, it's like, okay. Like, I am, you know, there's a superimposition of a Granny Smith apple, a Fuji apple, a Red Delicious, you know, a cartoon yeah. drawing of an apple. Like, like you know, <laughs> which one do you want? <laughs> like, that, that that's yeah. kind of where it goes. So, for me, it's less about, like, painting a picture in my head which takes time you know mm -hmm. like like that that is an active like visualization process for me you know uh as opposed to being instantaneous like it is or like like i mm. assume it is for a lot of people but yeah it's uh I, I think that saying do you do this yes or no is less interesting than like you know interrogating what exactly this means or what what the process is like yeah. if if you're doing the thing what is actually happening because right. like I, I sincerely don't know how to answer this question mm -hmm. whether I have this thing or not like I can close my eyes and think about an apple mm -hmm. and I don't see anything and right. if I start thinking about what I'm seeing mm -hmm. I'm just seeing the back of my eyelids which is that just weird like light escaping through psychedelic <laughs> right. pattern it's like yeah, getting that, under the blankets when the lights on in your room <laughs> you know um so I'm not seeing anything so I don't actually know how to answer the question. Mm -hmm. And it, it 
this felt, and this is, I'm not accusing uh, the asker of this, but this did feel like a thing online where it's a way to categorize a self. Oh, yeah. That yeah. people will, will jump onto. You know, like if somebody can grab a new identity, like I'm an empath, mm-hmm. like people will generally do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of like when, like when a uh, when a conversation about synesthesia comes up, like there's yeah. there's associations that I think everybody has. But then there's actually like the diagnosed and observable neurological phenomenon. <laughs> you yes. Know? You know, or it gets down to like, what kind of processor are you? Like, I'm I'm an auditory processor personally. I don't know that that's going to be yeah. a huge huge, uh, huge surprise for a lot of people. Yeah, you know, but that also is a way to like you know Introverts. distinguish. Yeah, and <laughs> extroverts. You know, <laughs> the, the, the 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 heinous and uh, yeah, the, the the heinous ambiverts that fit nowhere. Yes. They walk yeah, they walk but... in no land comfortably. Yeah, where's your crown king? Nothing. <laughs> um, the uh, yeah, so. so this is just one of the, and I think that, I'm not saying the the asker was is engaging this, but I think no. the article was engaging in this, and that's why it went so viral is because if people realize there's a new kind of category for themselves, yeah, they rush. There's a yeah natural urge to be like, which am I? Yeah, they 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 rush you know? to caucus is what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was just kind of a fascinating thing to see, and I, I don't really have an answer for it because I don't know how to describe the process. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. Um, yeah, uh, moving on here, uh, Ellen says, and this is less a question and more of an attaboy, but I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Um, Ellen says, uh, a key ingredient to make, that makes watch out for fireballs and duck feed network as a whole inspiring to me is the integral part politics, social commentary, and just plain human decency plays in your gaming dialogue. Gaming and leisure in general, isn't simply an apolitical atoll in our lives. As Gary said previously on the show, all art is political as such. The discussion always feels germane to the game and evaluation. We all know that the current political climate is a trash fire. I'm curious as to what resources the two of you utilize to stay abreast of the contemporary landscape, whether it be podcasts, websites, or alternative venues. I want a great, to greater expand my personal knowledge of socially responsible resources, and as I respect your political judgment, uh, any recommendation would be appreciated. Thanks for providing a podcast about games, or proving that a podcast about games can be about so much more. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that is very nice of you. Yeah. So the question um, here seems to be like, like what, what sources uh, kind of inform our conceptual understanding of these issues and our vocabulary about them it feels like Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean for me i have kind of cycled through a bunch of different podcast sources and things like that ultimately landing on um majority report uh with sam cedar is kind of the current Mm -hmm. events podcast that i that, that i listen to the most they have a really good just kind of political analysis of that kind of stuff it's more like like surface level uh you know just like hey we're responding to what's happening right now uh they do have uh interviews with authors and things like that which is always interesting and fun they do recommend like books uh and, and things like that but that tends to be um my primary source for a lot of this kind of stuff and obviously it's it's pretty lefty um for kind of mm. deeper uh d- dives into things you know any kind of like left tube if 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 if, you, if anybody says bread tube to me i'm gonna lose my fucking mind <laughs> <laughs> it's not a great phrase no i just i picture it's a roll of croissants yes. <laughs> in, yeah. in the fridge yeah 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 uh no but just uh you know people like sean uh people like three mm-hmm. arrows um for kind of like broader uh looks into historical things uh specifically yeah, or philosophical kind of generalities yeah yeah and stuff yeah yep. uh, i do i do the youtube as well the, those same those lighter youtubes i don't do uh current political uh youtube stuff just because it's it's not good for me mm-hmm. um in general how i stay on top of things is and you know is primary sources got to through twitter Mm-hmm. Uh, which is not, you know, it's not me saying like someone says on Twitter, hey, this. Mm-hmm. And I go, yes, this. <laughs> I go, someone says, hey, this. And then there's an article. And then I look at the article. And then if it's, you know, from something uh, reasonable, mm-hmm. you know, then that goes in the knowledge bank. Yeah. And if it's not, then it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, in a general sense, mm-hmm. um, it is hard, if not impossible, to find non biased political coverage um is one of the things that like i've come upon like the idea you know originally i felt a little bit of guilt about like you know watching those youtubes or am i I bubbling yeah yeah am i bubbling but every it's like if it's not going to be biased from that direction it will be biased from another direction right and then the media itself is kind of this weird omni bias towards the middle yeah uh, okay corporate media is just a big pack so (laughs) exactly (laughs) like like, that is that is you know become clear to me here in 2020 so like 
it's not a thing where I can get unbiased mm -hmm. news. Yeah. I can look at sources and figure out what is actually happening factually and then make up my own mind about it Yeah, yeah. a little bit. And mm -hmm. that's what I've been trying to do. So yeah. like, you know, hey, this thing is happening. And then I have thoughts about whether that is a good or a bad thing that are influenced by other thinkers mm -hmm. and stuff that I appreciate. But the actual news reporting itself is always going to put some kind of like spin on it. Yeah. You know, like, like generally when you look at a story, you can see how well reported it is. You can see, okay, are the, you know, like, what's the number of sources or the sources named, you know, is this a story that is coming from a pundit as opposed to, you know, something that is like actually reported, which is oftentimes mm -hmm. really hard to discern. <laughs> yeah. you, you know uh is you know is this a person who uh passed along really motivated kind of stuff i think that the you know i understand the instincts and i also felt a certain amount of guilt too like hey do i need to balance my media diet etc cetera, etc cetera. ultimately i kind of decided that you know that is kind of similar to just like saying to myself the truth is somewhere in the middle cole the truth is somewhere in the middle you know, and like to quote unquote balance it out would be like going and reading like Fox News or something like that. Yeah. You know, just like I, 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 I have I have determined a worldview and an interpretation of facts that works for me. Um, the actual facts that I get and the stuff that's brought to light that is still there, you know, as separate from the spin that is provided by the people who bring it to me. Right. You're going to get spin. You may as well enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. You know, like there's going to be spin. Yeah. So take take the non spin, you know, and and digest that. But if you're going to have a spin, don't. There's no f point in forcing yourself. Like other than like anthropologically, yes. Like it's useful to know what Chuck Cucker Tucker Carlson <laughs> Cucker Tarlson, yeah, Cucker <laughs> Tarlson. It's useful in knowing what Cucker Tarlson is saying. Yeah. Uh, Tarlson, son of Tarl, uh, <laughs> the Cucker of the Hill Tribes. Um, it's useful. It's useful in knowing what what he's saying. But I'm not going to get enrichment from it. No, no, you no. know, it's not really how this works. Yeah. And, like, and you know, I, I, I mute people on Facebook if they share that shit, but I, I usually wait a while to see a, to see a few to establish a pattern. Yeah. Yeah. It's no. kind of like, okay. Um, I, I need to weigh two things, broadening my perspective or managing my blood pressure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. Um, yeah. Speaking of, let's move on to uh, media questions. Uh, let's do. And so do. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. let's go down here. Sorry. Oh, this one's easy. Andrew writes, yeah. uh, have you listened to any of the members of REM's post REM work? I know Michael Stipe has done some solo work recently and Mike Mills and company, uh, have some stuff out there. Any interest in an appendix episode of file underwater? Um, I, I have found Michael Stipe's new singles really hard to listen to. Yeah. Uh, personally, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Peter Buck has never really stopped making music, but he like guest stars in a lot of bands that I am not predisposed to like. Yeah. Uh, Mike Mills has not been doing a lot of original music. He's done like some appearances and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, the way this would come out is uh, eventually the monster 25th anniversary will come out on streaming stuff. And we have long talked about just dropping an episode out of nowhere mm -hmm. when we get a chance to listen to that. And then we'll probably talk a little bit about R.E.M. About Town. Mm -hmm. during that episode but yeah. i don't want to do just an episode on michael stipe solo stuff because i i think i'm realizing like that dude cannot do melodies like mm -hmm. he needs people better people to write the songs around in which he sings yeah yeah uh, yeah it's, so. it's it's funny whenever whenever a team atomizes like that you yeah. you, you can kind of see what they were responsible for <laughs> you know yeah. and and you know in in what they and what they excel in when they're when they're by themselves you know yeah yeah yep yep yeah, uh, I, I I I don't have anything to add on top of that. Like I listened to like thirty seconds of it, and I was like, yeah, it's probably probably Whoa. not, not yeah, for me. It's, it's it's not great. It's been very you know I, I am in a band. It's very fun because REM is one of the big things that brought us together. But we all got to go. We all got to groan into that bullshit. Yes, uh, which I appreciated. <laughs> um, you're a capricious soul indeed. Yeah. Um, Another Andrew says, mm -hmm. uh, what are some uh, tendencies that can make or break a comedy movie or TV show for you? For example, I've been incredibly over the Apatow. Here are a bunch of dudes just improv and convos about fake drugs and fake sex positions. Some improv can be fine, but uh, if it's based on a well-constructed character, but I generally prefer my comedy, be comedy to feel pretty tightly written. Um, you, you know, this, at the time this kind of all happened. So my ex-wife, uh, and I were huge into the extended Apatow verse, mm -hmm. uh, as was the style at the time. 
Um, she stuck with it longer than I did. Mm -hmm. But at the time, this was incredibly refreshing to me. Yeah. Um, you know, the, like when 40 year old virgin came out, I've talked about this before, but it was one of the first movies I saw where characters seemed like they were making each other laugh. Yes. Like it wasn't just like, uh, you know, Jack and Jill or something in, like, I don't know, like somebody fell down and it's for the audience to laugh at. Mm -hmm. It's the characters in the world are friends and make each other laugh. And that was like very revelatory to me. Yeah. Um, in terms of, of comedy. Um, now every once in a while, there is a moment where I'm just like, Oh, this is definitely just like they're letting the people improv and it's a little tedious. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like I really noticed that with um, with Talladega Nights, actually. Oh, sure. But, but, yeah. but, like, that was the breaking point for me because I really, you know, Anchorman was foundational, formative, 40 yeah. year old virgin, foundational, formative, you know. But when they decided when they decided to, to just kind of start letting that run and it became very clear that everything was edited, edited together with scotch tape. That's where it started yeah. coming apart for me. Yeah. I, I, so I, I would agree that that's run its course yeah. or just requires like a really steady hand, Yeah, um, you know, to be good. And I generally do prefer, uh, you know, more, more written comedy and less improv. Like something that's very tight and dense is really, really appealing to me. Like yeah. I like improvised comedy just fine, but something that is like a high concept with like small a bit amounts of improv is very appealing. Yeah, uh, to me, you know, I feel, I feel like I I make I make this point every single time this comes up, but um, the thing that makes or breaks makes or breaks it for me is related to the forty year old virgin thing. Do the characters feel like they're listening to each other? The perennial example for mm -hmm. this is Bob's Burgers versus The Simpsons, right? The yeah. Simpsons feels focus tested to launch jokes at the viewer as quickly and with as much velocity as possible, whereas Bob's Burgers mm -hmm. is tightly scripted, but the actual like interactions feel improvised. Revised, it feels like they are actually recognizing the characters are recognizing each other as people. This is something that happens in, um, oh gosh, uh, what's his name? Um, sure, Michael Schur, uh shows mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, you know, um, where the the you know the, the the improv angle is more just in really good acting. It's people who might come from that uh, who are who who have a concept that like yeah, like you need to pay attention to each other. Yeah, it's it's the Simpsons is a really damning comparison in this kind of thing. Just because I was thinking about like you just saying that may just made me think that like are the Simpsons characters even characters anymore or are they voices? They're they're like voices like, and archetypes. It's this weird. Yeah, it's this weird. Like they're kind of like homunculus is made of their history. Mm -hmm. Like Lisa is a killjoy who has this voice. Anything you can make her say that's funny using those only those two things mm -hmm. goes. Yeah, you know, and it, it's a it's a bummer. Like as somebody who's been dallying with like late period Simpsons, mm -hmm. uh, you know, since the advent of streaming Simpsons, um, yeah, it's it's been uh, been disappointing. So I would agree with that. Like yeah. in general, I want something that feels a little bit more real and a little bit more character focused. Yeah, and not doing that mm -hmm. uh, is a bummer. Yeah, um, and also anything that plays with reality, honestly, is a, is a huge thing for me. Uh, just uh, basically, so I, I watched all of Review, Gary. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Did you like it? <laughs> I love it. It's so good. Isn't it great? Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> uh, it, man, just as as dark as that gets, and like review and Nathan for you are kind of like two comedy relevant, two comedy revelations uh, that 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 I got to about like four years too late, I think. So I feel mm. feel very late to this particular party. But the thing that makes me laugh so much about both of those is that it does like all of the comedy is about playing with the box. It is about yeah. messing with what is actually happening in this. The uh, I got a recommendation for you. Okay, uh, and it's 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 not out yet, and it'll be short when it comes out. But when I saw Tim and Eric, they showed an episode of their upcoming sitcom Beef Boys or Beef House. <laughs> I've, I've seen I've seen Tim uh, pumping this on Twitter. Yeah, uh, Beef House is going to be a mandatory watch. <laughs> Beef House is about playing with the box. Like cool. it, it is taking sitcom premises and plots in the weird way that like sitcom thing sitcoms like foreshadow and callback and stuff, uh -huh. and just making it as like grotesque and as extreme and weird as possible. It's really mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Uh, I was very happy to see, to get a chance to check that out. So big recommendation for playing with the box comedy. Yeah. Uh, oh, additionally, something else here, something that will break, break it for me is if the comedy is especially mean spirited. Mm. Yeah. 
it, de- it depends for me. Like there's some things that are definitely mean that work for me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I used to think that mean spirited would always just like always be a deal breaker and it's kind mm-hmm. of not like, it, it's always sunny as mean spirited, but it works for me. Yeah. Like, it, it's like, it's super mean about the characters itself. Like that is the perennial exception yeah. for me. Like, like nobody gets yeah. away with it. <laughs> no, no. Like that's a, that's a great, you know, it's, it's incre- incredibly mean show, mm-hmm. but it just kind of like that works for me. Yeah in that respect like and it, it's mean to the right people i guess mm-hmm. is what i yeah, want that's i actually like meanness mm-hmm. i just want you know it's like how i like violence i just want it to happen to the right thing <laughs> like, yeah, you know, yeah. I know, it's like an oversimplification yeah. but like <laughs> in media like I, I like you know i love john wick like I, mm-hmm. I love those movies i love that shit because there's a righteousness to it and it makes it very thrilling mm-hmm. you know so yeah yeah same thing with meanness <laughs> as long as you're being mean to horrible things i don't mind yeah um here's an easy one uh, I think, uh, Tom says, uh, having backdoored my way to, into the network through monster, my podcast, have you found any other non play D and D podcasts on YouTube or YouTube channels are similar? Um, as an aside, monster, my podcast makes a great time to kill time, a great way to kill time during road trips. I look forward to listening every time I travel. Thanks. Um, so I d- imagine that I have the, more of the answers on this than you do just cause I'm more plugged into tabletop. Yeah. So I like, I, I only have like one answer. I listened to the first season of adventure zone, um, mm-hmm. and enjoyed that, but kind of cut off generally, you know, this is depressing. My non-politics podcast listening is drawn back to basically nothing. Um, yeah. so I'm not really, uh, plugged into that anymore. So well, Tom had I, specifically said non-play, uh, D and D podcast, non-play. Ooh. Yeah, so so like you know, uh, Critical Role and Adventure Zone and Friends of the Table and stuff are those kind are of actual play. examples. Yeah, actual play. Yeah, and I don't I don't really listen to those. Um, that doesn't work for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know what it is. I like I've tried to listen to them and I don't like it. Yeah. Um, the the two pod, you know, there, I'm sure there's more uh, tabletop podcasts that are very good, but mm-hmm. I the one I listened to uh, that went away. So this actually eventually ended, but is kind of evergreen. Uh, was called NPC Cast. Hmm. Um, which was three dudes in Seattle, um, generally on the right side of politics shit, um, and did interesting things. Like they would do, um, episodes that were like about different genres. Mm -hmm. So like here are things in horror. Like if you're doing a horror role-playing game, like here are things to consider. Um, and then they would do things where they would come up with campaign settings where they would each, uh, come up with a random ingredient Hmm. to bring in. And it would just be like a concept. Like, uh, you know, yokai or like, you know, mechs or, you know, more, more interesting than that. But they'd come up with a concept and then kind of pitch a campaign setting. Mm-hmm. Uh, really fun. And then on YouTube, I don't know, you know, there are lots of answers for this, but I, I adore uh, Matt Colville. I think, I think Matt Colville is just like a really good human being. And I think he does really good advice. He does a series called Running the Game. Uh, he's kind of old school. So he, he plays D&D. He doesn't play you know, story-based, uh, you know, kind of, kind of more expressive hip young games. But I mm-hmm. think his storytelling advice, uh, in general is just very strong. Yeah. Um, every one of those videos is a treasure. Nice. So well, great. hopefully that gives them a place to, a place to start. Yeah. Yeah. Check out Matt Colville. Yeah. Uh, do you want to do a couple of show questions and then <clears throat> pop on over to our topic? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, so yeah. Cinder Elf writes, will you do an adaptation to Kay, uh, on the Witcher Netflix show? Uh, it may be based on the books, but they have clearly taken some parts from the games, like how Geralt's voice is similar. Um, also, I don't think the show is a bad adaptation. I just want to hear you guys talk about it a bunch. Mm. Uh, the Witcher um, TV show is good. I like it quite a bit. I have not watched it, uh, but we probably will do an adaptation to Kay on it eventually. Yeah, it's just, just uh, it. it's a t- it's a tough ask. Like I came out in December, which is the worst possible time to like sign up to mm-hmm. watch uh, to, to, to watch an entire season of a show uh, for, mm-hmm. you know, uh, a show. But uh, yeah, it's just a matter of fitting it in, fitting it into a schedule. Yeah, it's an adaptation to K tends to be an hour or two hours of prep mm-hmm. and 10 hours of prep is harder. Yes. You know, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm down. I'm mm-hmm. interested. Yeah. Um, Gabriel says uh, I recently is. Uh, Listen to the Team Fortress 2 episode and thought it was really cool that you guys made a WAF server and played with fans. Would you consider, consider doing something like that again? And if so, what games would be fun to do this with? Uh, on that note, one of us fans should make a DuckFeed server for hosting many popular online games. 
um, we have talked about this, and someday we will do this for Left 4 Dead. Yes. Uh, I, have a, I have a mighty Left 4 Dead 1 and 2 episode in me. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love those games. Uh, those are really important to me, and I would love the chance to talk about them. And when we do, we will set up a Left 4 Dead zone. Yeah. Agreed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think there's other stuff like Minecraft would be fun to do. Um, for me, personally, I don't, I don't know that I would want to make you, Gary, play Minecraft, but... I mean, I, I would, I'm, I'm not against Minecraft. Yeah. Like it's, it's very complicated now, but I had mm-hmm. fun with Minecraft when I was playing it, uh, you know, to a degree, mm-hmm. like eventually I always get far enough down the tech tree where I get bored. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but initially I think Minecraft is pretty fun. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Um, this mm-hmm. one should be pretty quick to answer just because the answer is maybe, uh, Greg says recently I've gotten into more gaming and related topic videos on YouTube, uh, which is kind of ironic since I listen to them at work. And I mean, just listen as I treat them like podcasts and listen to the audio. Uh, do you guys have any favorite YouTube channels and or content creators? Uh, and I know that you're doing more stuff on YouTube, uh, but do you have any plans to expand and do more a video version of WAF perhaps? Um, I, I don't want to do a video version of Loft because mm. I think it would be more than duplicating our work. Yes. Um, and also uh, I'm very happy with our approach to making Loft and I don't want to change it, especially and, for, for what feels like maybe a capricious reason. I don't feel like it would yeah, and, add an awful lot. No, it will. And also YouTube, like YouTube monetization and stuff is famously a nightmare. Like yes. people burn out and, and, and really you have to chase an algorithm and stuff. Mm. But that's all stuff I'm not interested in. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, to me, like, my answer to any of this stuff, like everything that we do for work has to be fun. Mm-hmm. A lot of my life is governed by instinct. Like I do stuff when it sounds good. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've been doing more video stuff after taking years off because it didn't sound good. Mm-hmm. And now it kind of sounds good. Um, who knows how long this wild ride will last. Right. Uh, so at least for my end, while that's still going on, I am down. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at some point I will probably burn out on it and then go back to strictly pod work. Yeah. And I've been doing, you know, video stuff for a while. So it's a it's a, it, it is like this weird it's this weird side of the network that is nowhere near as popular as the uh as the audio stuff mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is uh w- which is funny because usually it's the other way around yeah. yeah um and as far as like youtube channels and stuff that we like there's a whole bonus show that we do about this yeah yeah Tube i was gonna talking. say like listen to talk and it is at the ten dollar tier it is a, mm-hmm. a, a duck feed presents um, which is not us trying to tempt people in the ten dollar tier so much as wanting to give more stuff to people who are already there. Yes. But if you want to bump up your pledge for a month just for five dollars and listen to all those, they're bite size and there's mm-hmm. like fourteen of them now or something. Yeah. yeah. And uh yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just us recommending YouTube. So we definitely kind of talk about that stuff. Yes. Since it's what I I do instead of TV mm-hmm. generally. Um, this is a real quick one, but I want to get out of the way because I'm always happy to restate this. Um, David basically uh, is asking about um, the executive produce tier of Watch Out for Fireballs, um, how that uh, how that works. Like, is it okay to bump up to $150 to suggest an episode and then bump back down? Um, whether that's like you have to stay at a certain amount or if that makes it worth our while, if you have to feel bad. Uh, the answer to all those things is you don't have to feel bad. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the way it's designed is just to bump up as a, as a one-time thing. Um, I'm not saying it will always be that way. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, at some point, like the reality of it is, and we have not made any decisions and nobody should panic and start busting each other's heads open and eating the sweet, sweet goo inside. Mm-hmm. But uh, the reality is, is we're booked out pretty far for those. Yeah. Um, so at some point, some change might happen with how we're doing that. But if we do, we'll be as clear and communicate it very clearly like we always do. Yeah. And we'll uh, communicate and it ahead now, of time as well. Like well ahead of time. Yeah. So nobody will be, you know, taken you know, taken by surprise. But as of now, that is the process. You mm-hmm. pop up to 150. I ask you for your three picks. Then you pop back down mm-hmm. or you stay at that level and you get another three picks. Like right. somebody, you know, people have done it for two months in a row, but we don't expect you to stay for many months mm-hmm. um, at that. And I think, you know, maybe what, you know, the reason why David asked, you know, whether I had to be there for a while to make it worth a while is that it is, you know, uh, uh, an afford, like not a four, you know, we're not here to tell you what $150 is uh, to you, but it's, it's not a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, for for choosing the subject of of an episode, like yeah. typical podcasts, typically charge more than that. Yes, uh, than we do. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that is the case. Right. So if you're looking to do that, do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, do we want to do the topic, or do we want to do lightning rounds? First. Let's do lightning round real quick. Lightning yeah. round is easy peasy. Yeah. No. Um, Ludwig writes, is wearing caps backwards still cool? Asking for a friend. Uh, nothing is cool except confidence. Yeah. And no. 
<laughs> uh, send a cinder elf uh what should i name my daughter <laughs> this is a lightning wrong question i tried to push through colette or green but no luck uh m Buceri says neo geo pocket color uh, you can't name a neo geo pocket color yeah or, i mean mine is neo geo pocket you can do the sequel right to my cat but don't name it after my cat um i don't know what you should name your daughter yeah uh don't name her after a <laughs> podcast <laughs> yeah yeah name your daughter patreon.com slash duck feed tv please yes. yeah um the daughter <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so. yeah uh let's see uh adam writes uh what is the cutest monster in resident evil gosh i love those darn frog hunters i think oh, they're frog in, hunters. yeah they're in uh oh that's in um oh yeah uh code veronica the ones that the ones will gobble you up yeah 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 those, you know, those guys are those guys are pretty cute. Mm-hmm. You know, cutest. I yeah. I just it's it's very difficult. <laughs> you know, they're not very cute to me. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, they're, 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 they're spooky. Um, you know, maybe like I would say like Nemesis mm-hmm. or Mister X. Yeah, like but, I would, I would like a plush Mister X would be awesome. Yeah, Mister X is dapper. Is the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's definitely the he most wears put his hat together. Forward. Yeah, <laughs> that's why he looks cool. <laughs> um, oh man. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jonathan says, uh, what is something you particularly appreciate about the city state slash part of the country that you live in? Um, I mean, aside from the low cost of living, I do think that I have a lot of natural beauty kind of around here, uh, kind of in the great lakes region and being able to go down to the mountains and stuff like that. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not all corn here, despite, uh, what may be said, lots of cool forest and stuff. And generally people here are pretty nice. Uh, best thing about city living is that every major event will come through my city. Mm-hmm. So if I want to go see Tim and Eric or any band, they will definitely play here. And that if I wanted to, I could eat at a different, amazing, delicious restaurant every night. Um, like I will, I'm never uh, any genre of food, any quality of food, I can have any time I want. Yes, I think that's very cool. Yeah, that is good. Yeah. Um, Holland writes: One of the following curses are about to befall you. Would you rather? A, have your eyes make the iPhone camera sound every time you blinked, or B, have your mouth make a wet fart sound every time you breathed in or out? A. A. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can just keep I, my eyes closed while I'm talking. Yeah. I would become blind. <laughs> right. You yeah. The, like, but, but, like, if it was B, nobody would ever take me seriously again. Do you know how often you breathe? it's basically what you do all the time yeah you know and you blink a lot too but like not as much as you breathe mm-hmm. and the other the big thing here is you breathe in your sleep so i wouldn't be able to sleep through that right you don't blink in your sleep mm-hmm. so yeah no uh, david says uh top three games that you want to play but you haven't gotten to yet uh pathologic 2 disco elysium divinity original sin 2 uh i'm going to say uh disco elysium um Disco Elysium, mm-hmm. and then maybe I mean like I don't know. Uh, I want to play uh, Dead Fire. I want to play Pillars of Eternity too, but I'm not like super horny for it. Yeah, you know, like there's nothing there's nothing I'm super horny for mm-hmm. other than Disco Elysium and then stuff that's not out. Yeah, like I'm feeling patient, so I don't have a good answer for this. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, and then finally here we have Scott who writes in, uh, with a question for each of us, Gary, uh, if you were going to run a tabletop RPG based on or inspired by darkest dungeon, which system would you use? Uh, that's incredibly tough. Um, it would, I mean, my, my answer, I think it has to be really crunchy cause that's a tactical game. Mm-hmm. Um, so my answer for, uh, tactics games is always iron kingdoms. Right. Um, so like small court iron kingdoms would work really well. Like small, mm-hmm. small map. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and the question for me, Cole, are there any survival horror games that you'd like to see as a tabletop RPG pathologic? I've got that on the yeah. brain. It'd be interesting. Mm-hmm. Like you, you could do it like as an experimental yeah. kind of bleak RPG. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So those work. are my answers. <clears throat> mm-hmm. uh, moving on to our topic. Um, David also says this, this is also David Giza. Uh, what makes a good remake? What do you look for in a remake? When should it differ from the original? When is a remake appropriate? Is it better just to make new things? This might be more appropriate for April when both three make and final fantasy seven remake are coming out. Uh, we're doing an advance because 
uh, you know, things are coming uh, out soon. But, right. Yeah. People are going to, you know, people right now are horny for RE3 make, which it's so soon. Oh my it's God. It's very soon. Oh. It's too soon. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't handle how soon it is. Like I, I have to, I have a lot of Grimrock to play. Yeah. I've got a lot of Grimrock to play too, but like, so I feel incredibly, I, I feel very bad that we are not going to be at the Midwest Gaming Classic that has thrown a lot of things into the air. The solace yeah. that I am taking is that means I will not be out of town the weekend that RE3 make drops. That's true. So yeah. I would rather meet all of you and for nobody be, to be sick ever. But at the very least, if I'm quarantining, I could be quarantining with this sure to be amazing game. So, yeah, I, I don't know that I'm going to play it right when it comes out. Ooh. I really I really want to. But I just I uh, I just, you know, I tend to I, I let dust settle sometimes. So, I mean, and I, a, and I, 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 it's an emergency. Up and I knock them down in order. It's an emergency. I, I, just, I don't have that. <laughs> I don't okay. have emergencies. OK. I live an emergency free life like okay. I. Uh, you know, I I, I I at least want to get through uh, Grimrock 2 and or The Surge first. Yes. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to get through, do those. Mm-hmm. And then I would feel like, okay, I can, I can chug this. Yeah. yeah. Cause it'll, it'll be like nine hours. Like, mm-hmm. you know, it's going to, it's going to be manageable. Yeah. Well, unless they decide like now is the time to make the 70 hour <laughs> Resident Evil campaign. <laughs> yeah. like, Open world. Well, Raccoon shit. City. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. Oh shit. <laughs> yeah, this sucks. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh man. <laughs> so um, th- this is a tough question, right? So to again, I'll do what I always do and set boundaries around this. We are looking at full-on remakes, like the you know Resident Evil One remake, um, things of that nature. Uh, not like an HD remaster, like Shadow of the Colossus. God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because things like that, like those kind of HD remasters, like that, or like The Last of Us, like. We, we talked about those a little bit uh, before, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I get it, you know, but the big thing for that is uh, playability to me, not graphical improvements. Right. It's to play The Last um, of Us, I don't have to get out my PS3. Exactly. Yeah. And more people will be able to play in the future. Just mm-hmm. putting a like a nicer coat of paint over something that already exists is of limited value to me. And I think that at a certain point, it almost becomes detrimental yeah. Like, I'm not trying to be the hipster who just likes old graphics, but as, like, time goes on, and, like, a big, you know, big thing is, like, revisiting Kingsfield, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm just like, man, th- this has a lot of value. Mm-hmm. Um, just losing this, you know, I don't want a super high-def Kingsfield one. No, no. N- you know, I need I need that to be as ugly as it is because it's all <clears throat> part of a whole. I just want it released on a virtual console. Mm-hmm. So I-, I wanted to speak to that that playability piece, but I don't really just want, hey, this but prettier. Like, yeah. basically ever. It, it's not something that's interesting to me. Mm-hmm. Like Dark Souls Remastered looks much better than Dark Souls. It's mm-hmm. cool that it exists, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to put the, put, put the boundaries up there. So we were clear what we were talking about. Yeah. We're yeah. talking about uh remake, you know, like our remake, mm-hmm. uh, things like that. Yeah. Um, And this is tough, right? And, and I, you know, I wish that I had a quicker, like off the cuff, a quicker off the cuff response about like what are bad remakes, you know, that have come mm-hmm. out because I, I actually like if, if you held a gun to my set and Hey, name a bad remake. I don't know that I could right now. Yeah. They tend, they tend to be fine. Yeah. You know, at, at the, at the very least, um, you know, and, and a lot of times the, you know, people can prefer the original, for things like that. Like I like the RE make more than the original Resident Evil one, but I also feel like that's not absolutely open and shut because there's probably something to those old textures and stuff that adds something in a Kingsfield esque way. Yeah. I like, like having recently gone back and by recently, I mean like a year ago, I did a stream of the Resident Evil director's cut. Like Mm -hmm. there is an alienness and an off puttingness that is a different kind that brings a different kind of dread than like the mechanical oppression of the remake. And it just depends like which of those do you value? Yeah. You know, so so it's not like there aren't like a bunch of like bad remakes. I can say like that there are things that will make me interested in a remake and things that will make me less interested. Yes. Right. So like, uh, one of the things that I think is key, and this is not me trying to shit in anyone's serial, because I understand a bunch of people are excited about it. One of the reasons why I'm not psyched about the FF7 remake is that I don't see the need for it. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel like it's something driven by a creative urge. Yeah. To me, it feels like something that is driven by a nostalgia uh, money-making urge. 
yeah uh, to me more than anything and that is kind of how i felt about squares let's expand on final fantasy 7 for decades <laughs> thing in general like it's kind of it's it's greasy you know, it's, like, it's, it's a pathetic it's stance. It, it's kind of like it, it, it's a design philosophy that might as well just be shit man might as well and like yeah i played the demo for that and i was really surprised at how much i liked it actually <laughs> Um, no, I, most people have, have, have dug the demo, Yeah, you know, so it's like, and it's like, yes, I could try it. Right. And like, I might have fun with mm-hmm. it. I just don't know that I'm interested in, like, I could have fun with just a, just a new Squaresoft thing that uses those mechanics. Like, I'm not really mm-hmm. interested in revisiting that story and doing it again. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and I, I don't especially care- when you have very I mean, I have little faith that when they get to the cool parts of it, you know, like after the Midgar stuff, you know, when it gets to the yeah. questions about like identity and hero worship and you know things like that, like, I don't know that I trust them to actually handle that in a good way. No, yeah. like it's not something I don't think Square are good writers right uh, now. And I just I also don't want like I think that that. So to me, like in, in bringing back to the question, something that can like put me off of a remake is if it feels like it is supplanting or harming an original. Yeah. And something about the the Final Fantasy VII remake that feels like it is supplanting or harming the original is expanding on the Avalanche cast. Yeah. Because one of the things about Final Fantasy VII that is so cool is that, you know, Midgar is a disc. Yes. And then you expand. You're like, the story is not really about that. We're going to, mm-hmm. we're telling that story within this other thing. But if you're giving Jesse and all these other characters, like rich backstories and personalities and lots of dialogue and stuff, mm-hmm. I think you're losing focus in a way that is going to be harmful to the overall experience. Yeah. Like, even if people are telling me like, actually the dialogue is not nearly as embarrassing as it is in the trailers. Yeah. The, know, the, that, that has been the case for me actually. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, just put it, putting in the report there, you know, Yeah, I I understand that's not as bad as it could be. Mm -hmm. I just feel I have this intense sense of like, what do why 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 this? Mm -hmm. What what is this expressing creatively? Yeah, you know. Whereas I feel like uh, you know to contrast, uh, you know, the Virgin Final Fantasy (laughs) Seven remake to the Chad RE two remake is what (laughs) the RE two remake did was like, hey, in Resident Evil two we had this Mister X thing, Mm -hmm. and it was barely a factor, right? in the you game know, what if a, we designed a game around that right <laughs> you, you know we, we can get across this feeling better that we always wanted to get across and mm-hmm. now we can actually realize it yes. and that feels purely additive to me mm-hmm. to to what's elemental about re2 and what i something i've secretly like not secretly but i've suspected about square mm-hmm. that the whole time is that what they want like they probably always wanted all these avalanche people to have you know, rich backstories and all this stuff right. and have this just like cinematic and, uh, you know, novelistic presentation above all else. Mm-hmm. And it is a company that was only good when they were under extreme restriction. Yes. Like when they couldn't do the things they want to do. And now that they can do the things they want to do, I am way less interested in them. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas the thing that they Capcom wanted to do with RE2 that they finally can do is much more interesting to me than like the story of Midgar again. Yes. Um, something for me that, um, uh, specifically about RE2 also, I think makes that work. And I don't know how applicable it is to everything else. Resident Evil as a franchise has enough history and it's kind of been through enough, like movements, you know, like different Mm -hmm. kinds of games that like the RE2 remake felt uniquely poised to like marry together a bunch of different elements from those different periods as well. Mm -hmm. And it kind of ends up being like a, like a best of all worlds to a certain extent. So like it felt, I don't know if that was their intention, but for me as somebody who, you know, goes way back basically to day one with that. I really appreciated that. It felt, you know, kind of necessary in that particular way for me. Yeah. 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 Like that, that is to me the thing that makes uh, both of those, you know, so those are the two big contrasts that like I've latched onto. And both of those different remakes are taking the mechanical side of something and rejiggering it. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, my understanding of Final Fantasy VII is it's basically crafted the the Final Fantasy XV battle system. Yeah. Onto FF7, 
um, with a greater differentiation in characters. Uh, RE2 takes something kind of similar to the RE2, you know, slow paced uh, thing, but kind of makes it a little bit like a hybrid between like RE4, you know, and, uh, and, and, and RE2, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of pace and stuff, but does make the mechanics a little bit. But I, I think in those two things as well, so the the mechanical difference between RE2 Remake and regular RE2 maintains a lot of the same tone. Yeah. Right? So, like, that kind of slow pace, caution mm-hmm. is incredibly important yes. in that. Whereas, you know, from looking at, uh, and I watched, like, a demo of Final Fantasy VII. I didn't download it, but I watched, like, a Let's Play of it or what have mm-hmm. you. Um, is just taking this thing that was never really part of Final Fantasy VII to me. Like, incredibly flashy, Advent Children-esque kinetic combat yeah and grafting it on mm. like this is this is more f- modern let's do this now yeah so you know, for, for for me it was less about the, about the aesthetic of this but i think that it was really canny for them to not strictly make it you know like a an octopath traveler like or bravely default throwback to that particular turn-based combat i think that if they attempted to do that that would be disastrous that is actually, I think, a very good thing that they did to update that particular portion of play. It doesn't it does that doesn't answer to me why the remake is happening though. Yeah, like why it's not just another game with that thing. Like mm-hmm. if you're going to update the combat, have it evoke something in the original that's special. Mm-hmm. And I think that this there, I, I agree that just doing it as turn based would be a problem. But I also think that the the project is misguided from the start. Like I don't yeah, think there's yeah. a creative impulse for it. <laughs> it's it's a little bit um, uh, like that that gag in um, Thirty Rock when they're talking about like okay like how do we fix like how do we fix NBC's flagging ratings or whatever? And you know like at the top of the list is like build a time machine so it's 1997 again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's yep, a little yep. it's a little bit like that. You know, again, just because just, just I know people's people's dander is up, I, I, I'm I'm positive on the actual thing that I played in the demo, and I'm going to get the actual game when it comes out. So yeah, it, it is. I am I'm happy to be the outlier on this. Yeah, um, I just feel like in it, it's relevant to the question in terms of remake, in terms yeah. of like what makes me interested. Because if like let's say I'm somebody who likes Final Fantasy VII, I like all of Final Fantasy VII. I don't just want the music and visuals, but with a more fun battle system. Yes then why wouldn't I want something that feels at least reminiscent? Yeah. And I feel like RE make and RE2 make do a really great job of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is not, in- and this isn't trying to do it. It didn't fail. Mm-hmm. It wasn't trying to do something reminiscent. It's just like, what if we throw some action combat onto this iconography? Everybody likes, Yeah. you know, and it just, it's, it, to me, that is not interesting as a remake. It is interesting as like, it can be interesting as a game. It could mm-hmm. still be like, it's a good game Yeah. on yeah. its own. But in terms of its relationship to Final Fantasy VII originally, I find mm-hmm. it a little bit odious. Yeah, is it, is it leaning on is it leaning on the the nostalgia as a uh, as, as as a crutch, right? As opposed to anything you know, else, like that that kind of puts you it know. a little bit like in, in in debt if you are like you know just in critical debt if uh, yeah. if, if you are examining it as like a as like a product, right? So so uh, to me yes yeah exactly like so a good a good remake is something that evokes the original mm-hmm. but modernizes it more than just like a shadow of the colossus you know this is prettier yeah. or dark souls remastered you can eat multiple soul items at once <laughs> like j- it actually just takes it and uh evokes the old feeling mm-hmm. without totally abandoning it yeah um, to broaden our example pool a little bit, I've got um, the, so basically, I just I just did, did a look video game remake. I've got examples of two good adaptations that I've played recently, or I guess uh, uh, updates and two bad ones. Which ones do you mm-hmm. need to lead to to lead with here? Uh, let, let's go. Let's go good first and end on the bad because it's twenty twenty. Okay. Yes. Um, so Metroid Zero Mission, I completely oh, sure. forgot to account for that as a uh, as a remake. <laughs> yeah and that's a great remake it's what's wonderful yeah. <laughs> like it, it it you know it, it takes something that is honestly pretty hard to go back to like your mm-hmm. uh like, like your original metroid um and it kind of succeeds at splitting the difference between what the original was and kind of like w- what you would rather be playing which is super metroid you know mm-hmm. it does a very good job of of, of kind of striking a balance between all that yeah and it's evoking again it's evoking the feeling like super metroid and regular metroid play pretty differently but they're all in ways that contribute to like getting the overall thrust 
mm-hmm. and kind of uh, kind of mood a little bit stronger. Yeah. You know, like uh, Zero Mission cuts off rough edges and adds interest in a way that maintains the identity, I think, mm-hmm. in, a, in a general way. Like, that's a great example of yep. something that does does it well. Yeah. Um, uh, also, something here recently that, that, that I played uh, that I enjoyed, uh, Link's Awakening. Uh, played mm. that recently on the Switch here. Uh, I liked how closely it hewed. Uh, to, to, like to, to, to the original while kind of just giving you quality of life upgrades like making the inventory uh less odious to mess with you know i i think that just taking the original game and giving it the uh the coat of paint and bringing it forward um is good when it's something like Link's awakening that was actually just like pretty pretty good and fun in the first place yeah yeah that, that, that to me feels like more of a stratigraphical upgrade yeah. to me there's a weird one too when like because I've, I've not played that i don't really like how it looks like i like mm-hmm. the original link so i can more so i and and finding out that it's, it doesn't do a lot yeah. like that it's like mostly quality of life things but that's something if it were a more drastic reimagining i might have been more into it yeah yeah which is a weird thing to say but i was just like why well, I, I already have links awakening on my my 3ds like mm-hmm. i played that pretty recently it's still pretty fun i don't feel a need for this really yeah. mm-hmm. you know um, um but that's also an aesthetic thing which is which ties into this whole bit right like y- yeah we talked you don't about like the... preferring re druthers cut to re make <laughs> right yeah no i, I just if, if i was given my druthers i'd rather have good pixel art than the uh you know the tilt shifted photography that we had yeah yeah and the, everything uh, looks wet <laughs> I'm, I'm fine i'm fine with the wetness i guess yeah, everything I like is, is recent recently spritzed yeah I, I, there's something about like everything looking kind of moist yeah looking kind that of happens black. in games like that that like bums me out <laughs> um okay so the, the 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 two the two examples of bad remakes that i want to bring uh mm-hmm. to the floor here so, so you know maybe we can learn by contrast here um one of them is tony hawk hd oh sure yeah that is that is a horrible remake yeah and uh, yeah. like i just it's one of those things where i don't know that i can actually like straight up tell you why i think it's bad it just felt awful and the music wasn't there yeah the, the um there's a lot it's all feel yeah like that is that was trying to be just a graphical upgrade yeah like a remix of levels but just trying to do a shadow of the classics uh graphical upgrade but while they were redesigning the mechanics of it, mm-hmm. they made everything slow and quiet. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to loud and good. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are like things that straight up don't work. Like it's just a broken yeah. version of that. Like you can't go into the um, airport, uh, like into the baggage Jesus. zone in that, in the Tony Hawk 3 level. <laughs> cool. Hi. The, yeah. the, this game that is about finding cool secrets and levels, we're going to take cool secrets out. <laughs> They didn't try to take it away. It's uh-huh. just broken. Yeah. You, co- you collide. The collision detection is different. Jesus. So that's a, that's one way you can fuck up a remake is just by being fucking incompetent about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah incompetent about it. Yeah. Uh, the other bad one, and I know that you're going to agree with me on this one here, Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 That's also a bad remake. Yeah. So like that that was like like two things. Obviously, the uh, cutscene um, uh, uh, upgrade is not good in that like that is they like they, they they took shitty stuff about later metal gear like specifically metal gear 2 on uh like that cutscene direction mm-hmm. and backported it into metal gear solid one which would by no means is strictly grounded but you know it did have kind of a grittier better feel <laughs> you know it's less embarrassing mm-hmm. let's say uh you know and adding like bullet time and you know sword ballet stuff into it not good um additionally they brought they they brought back metal gear solid 2 first person aiming and just the general like 3d maneuvering and hanging stuff in ways that specifically broke encounters in that so it was kind of like we okay we can but should we and the answer was no that yeah that's that's giving a new verb set yeah to a character and not changing the space they're in yes and and a good example of a good version of that, which is not strictly a remake, but I think is kind of relevant, mm-hmm. um, are the uh, Shovel Knight expansions, mm, yeah. where levels remain largely unchanged, but they change your, I mean, some, somewhat unchanged, yeah. and then they change your avatar uh, verb set. Yeah. Uh, and one of the triumphs of those, you know, the, the Shovel Knight battle chest is one of the best video games you can buy. 
um, or treasure chest is one of the best video games you could buy, um, is that they've done it. It's like endlessly clever. Yeah. Like, I don't like any of them as much as I like the original Shovel Knight Mm -hmm. campaign, but they are so clever the way that they've come up with different ways for that to work. Yeah. Um, And it feels the same. Mm -hmm. Like, none of them are just like, this guy can jump. Mm -hmm. You know, like, they're all still weird little twists on mobility in 2D platforming uh, that feel, you know, original, feel faithful to the original yeah uh, and a, a lot of that is also uh kind of I, I think a function i think that yacht club is actually just a group of much more talented and competent developers than silicon knights was like yeah <laughs> you know and like that is largely borne out by history about what a fucking mess silicon knights was revealed to be mm-hmm. uh well and and just kind of like you know it's it's hard to tell like part of it could be that they were you know, a, a failure in consideration. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it, it's, they just didn't think about it mm-hmm. or it could be that they were just not very good. Yeah. Yeah. And either so. way it comes out to the same, the same kind of thing. Just yeah, yacht club. They like, they seem pretty thorough in, you know, being, <laughs> going back to the thing and re- redesigning, you know, redesigning elements of the game and making sure that it all works as opposed to the kind of embarrassing you know, jam ups that you get in twin snakes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so so again there's there's an element uh i mean that ties ties into kind of like a nice wrapper for this that that applies to all of it is that it's something that i want to trust the people doing it yeah, yeah. Uh, and i want to trust them at least as much as the people who made the game and that yeah. can both be uh when you bring in other people and you know uh like just bringing tying it back into Capcom and Square real quick is that mm-hmm. like I trust modern Capcom. We talked about how much of a miracle it is that RE Seven came along and was like, oh, this is a good company again. An RE Two remake, RE2 came out. <laughs> an RE Two yeah. remake would be a much dicier proposition if they didn't knock it out of the fucking park with RE Seven. Exactly. They, you know, if the if the team that make that made RE Six came forward and said, hey guys, we're gonna go back to your old favorite that you love, like I'd be, I, I don't know, guys. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I and, like RE Six. And- so <laughs> same same and for me square is still putting out a succession of re6s yeah, yeah you know and they haven't stopped doing re6s mm-hmm. basically like i'm just not like i don't trust the new square as much as i trust the old square yeah and i don't you know i want to trust a company other than silicon knights yeah you know not a company that turned into silicon knights mm-hmm. um so there there's a those are kind of the elements that i think are important to it yeah Agreed. Uh, trust that they know what they're doing. Trust that they respect the source material and trust that they're going to be able to translate and preserve the cool stuff. Yes. Yep. Yep. Um, moving on to responses. Uh, so we thank you uh, for your questions and prompts. Um, again, if you would like to give us question and prompts next time, um, it is a Patreon post that we put up mm-hmm. every month. You do it in response to that. Uh, unlike your responses to our games, which are going through the contact uh, forum. Some people have been confused about that. The reason mm-hmm. why those are different is because uh, responses about the game are open to everybody, but questions and prompts are open to patrons. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to get us started here with responses with our response about Valda's story. Uh, Moonborn mm-hmm. writes in via contact saying, I bounced off of Valda's story fairly early. However, I wanted to write in about one of the Kickstarter backer characters, a literal 2002 original character in OC named, I'm going to try to pronounce this, Ray's Seattlin. Um, Ray's stands out among the other generic anime OCs, specifically because he's literally everywhere. His creator has been using the get your own character into the game Kickstarter tier to inject him into at least five games, possibly more, including such indie darlings as Shovel Knight and Indivisible. Uh, he also has his own wiki with way more info than, than anyone would care to read and a thankfully now inactive roleplay Twitter account with such amazing quotes as, quote, there's something you aren't telling us, isn't there, Shovel Knight? <laughs> there's, mm. there's really no grand point to uh, no grand point to this. I just found it surreal and amusing. Included below are the wiki and Twitter links uh, if you'd like to look upon the truly bizarre with your own eyes. Yeah, I don't like this. No, no, uh, and, and, and <laughs> I. I nice. I suspected that this was the kind of bullshit going on, at least with some of mm. the uh, get your character included. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and i'm the person who when given a chance to record a voicemail for thimbleweed park just said watch out for fireballs so this this is this is different uh yeah he's he's one of the wandering boss battles in shovel knight 
Jesus. Taking, taking a look at now. He's the guy with the boomerangs. Ooh. Um, yeah, there's there's something greasy about this. Yeah, no, no offense to this guy. Yeah, <laughs> but like just and definitely no offense to Moonboard. Thank you for bringing this to my attention. Like, n- n- yeah, this no, makes me this wish is... we were recording Adric suffering right now. <laughs> me too. This is an Adric suffering ass thing. Yep. <laughs> uh, hey, Wiki Dot, so, why do, why are you letting this happen? <laughs> yeah, it, it's greasy. Yeah. Um. Thank thank you for bringing that to my attention. Mm-hmm. Um. Moving on to Axiom Verge. Uh statements uh eric says uh as trace awoke one morning from uneasy dreams he found himself transformed into a oh crap a ding dang bug now <laughs> uh, crap a damn a ding dang bug <laughs> and, uh, ding, ding. oh crap um, oh crap yeah. i definitely shouldn't yeah. oh uh, man it's, it's hot today <laughs> um, I'll do the next one as well because that was a sentence. Okay. Uh, Zane says via contact, uh, I always enjoy a good reality bending, identity questioning story. But what, made Axi- what made Axiom Verge special was what Trace uh, looks a lot like me, especially as a scientist where lab coats and sideburns are job perks. Mm-hmm. It had a nice meta layer of questioning my actions. I would consider dressing up as him for Halloween if I thought anybody on the street would actually recognize the character and not just assume uh, this was Zane with science gun. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> oh. um, it's, a lot of people said he looked like Bob Mackey and I think we talked about it in the episode but I don't mm-hmm. necessarily see it yeah. Bob does not have big hair it, yeah his, it, it's, uh, his, his hair is not uh, it, it, Bob, Bob looks like Beck is the thing yes yeah Bob, yeah Bob has long flowing hair and then he cut it and now it's like shoulder length flowing hair yes. but it's not like a big poofy yeah it, it's, it's know, axiom verge haircut it's, it's not like the one guy from Zombatatoes which is kind of what Trace looks like to me you got Zombatatoes on the brain man. <laughs> yeah and no did, because it popped up we did that we did, we did yeah. that pop-up stream for Ducks of Fury and that was yep. the first game that came up on the <laughs> Oh on yeah the, on the roulette um, it was the fucking pits man <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, Eli writes in via contact saying, I'm happy uh, the show got me to give this game another shot uh, after my first attempt ended because I found the combat too frustrating on account of the high damage that late game enemies do. While it has problems, I think I kind of love this game. It just does such weird stuff. A lab coat to glitch you through walls, a telebeam thing to glitch out enemies. Sign me up. What really made my second attempt shine was realizing just how great glitching out enemies can be. I remember being very frustrated by the purple crawler bugs that shoot red lasers at you. Bad game design, I thought. But once glitched, their laser turns blue, and instead of damaging you, they break down certain blocks. Learning that the glitch ray tends to work as a counter to many enemies later in the game uh, made uh, made that game, uh, the late game, so much more enjoyable for me. Uh, that annoying spinny guy bouncing all over. Now he's got. Uh, now he has slowed down. Uh, that thing shooting homing shots all around. Now it shoots out health. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's a neat idea. I I you know just restating something in the episode. Like I like this. It ended up feeling a little chore like mm. to me at a certain part. <clears throat> but I do I like the idea of it. Yeah, the fact that it takes time is a thing. Like I wish it was just an item that like glitched out, uh, glitched out mm. stuff automatically as opposed to yeah. being a thing you had to I mean, like hold you know tr- hold train down. on them over time. Yeah, yeah. But it's a definitely a neat idea for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, I hope it gets expanded on the sequel. Uh, Patches says via contact. I'm glad you all covered Axiom Verge. It's a game that I think has a lot of interesting style and ideas without coming together to be one of my favorites. I played an earlier version where the end of the game was brutally hard, and even when I came back post-patch, I really needed the flamethrower to make the last area tolerable. Hmm. What it did do was really cement in my mind why I think I prefer Metroid-likes to Igavania-ish games. Guns are more interesting than swords. The feeling of getting weird shooty shapes and components just feels more interesting to me than spells. Uh, And the best of these game design uh, work around those shapes as being important to movement and combat. Unlike a Momodora or Hollow Knight, where your verb set is mainly movement based. That is a distinction that I don't see made very often, and it's salient. Yeah, that, that's, uh, I, that is logically follows, and I respect that opinion, even though I will always choose swords and spells over guns yep. 100 times out of 100. Mm-hmm. But like, part of, you know, who knows what that is? I'm happy you know? Death's Gambit ended up being the game that it was as opposed to what it began with. But I can yeah. I, I, I absolutely see the distinction here. And it is one of the, you know, uh, many, many to a handful of things that makes the comparison or like lumping all those things together uh, kind of a fraught, uh, mm-hmm. kind of a fraught move. Yeah, is it, there's an interesting idea that like you either have uh, guns or movement stuff. Yeah, because that or projectiles or movement stuff, because that does tend to be the case. Mm-hmm. You know, games that that kind of put those together, 
um, when they do, your ranged weapons tend to be like nothing. Right. Like in Bayonetta, you can shoot bullets, but it's just to like tap. It's to, to keep a combo enemies. going. Yeah. Yeah, keep a combo going. It's not to uh, to do significant damage. Yeah. So it's pretty interesting uh, and pretty rare when those things meet. Mm-hmm. So. Um, let's see here. Ben writes via context saying backtracking and axiom verge is counter motivated by the fast clip at which you get new verbs. I found that while working my way, uh, from the drill to the next main area, there were glitchy walls, small drone gaps, and one with walls that I could come back to. Uh, but it never made sense for me to go back with just one new verb, given, uh, given that if I wait just a little bit longer, I'd find another verb and I didn't want to have to go back to the same old area multiple times. The game thus taught me not to do intermittent backtracking to get power-ups, especially when so many of these power-ups were pretty minor. Uh, I ended up getting, uh, ended up just getting all of the end game equipment and doing one roundup at the very end, which given the nature of power-ups made the middle of the game a bit harder than it was probably intended. I love Axiom Verge, but it uh, pretty quickly discouraged me from backtracking for secrets. One of the pillars of the genre. Uh, very well yeah, observed. I like that analysis. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, definitely well observed is what I was going to say. Yeah. Well done. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Um, another Ben <clears throat> says via contact. Uh, I bought Axiom Verge on Switch years ago, but fell off of it very early on. I finally decided to jump back into the game when I found out it was coming up for the show, and having beaten it, I was surprised by how cold it left me. While the atmosphere and art are amazing, I think there's no better example of the game failing itself than the moment when you enter a room, only see yourself, or a doppelganger, leaving the room straight ahead. I froze when this happened, excited and tense, only to have that uh, completely deflated when Trace immediately chatters to Elsanova, I think I just saw myself! (laughs) I couldn't help but compare this to the moment hollow knight that pulls the same trick leading up to the nosk fight but while that reveal was an absolute uh, master class in horror axioms left me with nothing but wishes for a game that was about 30 percent better in pretty much every non-aesthetic category ultimately i enjoyed my time with axiom verge but i don't think it's something i will ever revisit yeah i just like it in the aftermath of our discussion the thing that i am most disappointed about with axiom verge is it is not the horror game that it ought to be yeah yeah. Yep. Should definitely be a bit spookier. Yes. Blah. Mm. Man, I just, just Hollow Knight has come up a few times on this. Uh, like I'm, I'm following Jeremy on Twitter. Uh, his uh, first playthrough. I guess he had never played Hollow Knight before, mm-hmm. and so like seeing his first reactions to all of that is making me really, really want to go back into it when I know I don't have the time. Yeah, I got it on on Switch with the DLC, and I have not played it even though one of those dlcs like sounds like a fucking nightmare yeah we is it to, is it more just bosses. massacre yeah it, it's all the bosses in a row with no save points it's something like that jesus christ and just like oh geez boy that's <laughs> hmm. Team cherry okay uh, hey, what, you hmm. what you doing uh whoa hey what's how's how's silk song coming along team yeah. cherry <laughs> do we have a, to have a, a talk a, a, a wild idea oh, um, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah i, w- I want to try the other things in it i want to do a replay i've just been doing other stuff yeah so that's the thing about doing I stuff. I picked up uh, this War of Mine on Switch after Frostpunk. Oh, damn. That, that came out on a, Switch? A yeah. Whew. And uh, and it's and now that I kind of am more tuned to the, uh, the rhythms of that, it's, mm-hmm. it's going down pretty smooth. It's fun. Shit. I need to get that now. <laughs> I love that game. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> I always wanted to put more time into it. And the Switch is the place where that kind of stuff lives. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's um, see. This is... Say. Okay, yes, I will pick up with Doug saying via contact, having replayed Axiom Verge for this episode of WAF, it helped me re- it helped me crystallize my lukewarm feelings about it. Uh, the game sets out to duplicate the look and feel of the original Metroid and largely succeeds. But that does not mean that this was worth doing. First, the regular plot and exposition dumps constantly break the sense of isolation and exploration that made Metroid tick. Uh, But more importantly, in duplicating Metroid, the game eschews ease of use considerations that reintroduce friction that other games had eliminated. In particular, the primitiveness of the map and the lack of fast travel and the lack of any signaling or flow about where to go next. Towards the end of his life, my grandfather's sight deteriorated uh, such that his field of vision shrunk considerably. That meant if he dropped something, he would have to painstakingly scan back and forth until he found it. Uh, And that is a little uh, what playing Axiom Verge is like. The discovery of any key item results in having to scour over the entire map to find the lock. 
even then, the key will be useful for at least a few locks uh, and is still a matter of trial and error to find the way forward. Uh, that was true of Metroid, uh, but I was a kid then with oceans of time and patience. The best Metroidvanias have made significant improvements in design to offset the problem. In this instance, even, even if trading the item away made for a more authentic Metroid experience, I don't think it made for a better one. For the record, I still like the game on balance, but I'm hoping the upcoming sequel will have less friction. Yeah, well, uh, well observed. Yeah, yeah, we're, uh, we'll, we'll see exactly what the what, what Hap listened to um, when uh, you know when Axiom Verge came out. We'll see. We'll see if yeah. he took the criticism the criticisms to heart. Uh, I mean, he didn't. They didn't get receive a lot of criticism. Like it's a you know, it's a beloved game. A thing. <laughs> yeah, so that that's always <laughs> yeah. a thing that happens. Where like right, you know, and it's one of the ways that like game journalism and, and game criticism is broken. Is that like right. everyone does their first impressions based on the ten hours they got to play. And then, you know, you end up with, like, Dragon Age Inquisition being called Game of the Year and shit. Right, right. Uh, until the dust has settled. Yeah. Um, so, I, for, like, I will be curious about Axiom Verge 2. It's not a day one purchase or even something I'm particularly excited about. Like, I would like an idealized version of that experience, but there's mm -hmm. so many other experiences I'm more hungry for. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I'll get to it when I get to it. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's supposed to be good, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, moving on to responses about Ocarina of Time, uh, people came out way in force. Yeah. So uh, I sincerely apologize if your response didn't get into this. It, it was literally just for time considerations that I kind of paired things back. Yeah. It was like the most responses we've ever gotten Yeah, for, for something. Uh, and just, uh, you know, in the interest of not repeating content and not just having this be a million years long, mm -hmm. we kind of cut it down a little bit. So forgive us yes. uh, for that. Uh, I'll do the first two. Because uh, this first one is terse. <laughs> uh, Adam says, don't care much for it. Or don't much care for it. <laughs> <laughs> that ocarina, boy. Ooh. Don't much care for it. Yeah. Lots of people well, going for the ocarina, man. but I am staying home. Yep, exactly. Uh, and then uh, uh, Popo Foshosho says, uh, via Chicago, which is the name of a restaurant in Portland. Mm, That's a uh, Chicago style food. It's the name of a good Wilco song. Also true. Yeah. Uh, I had a deep dish Chicago pizza mm. the other day for the first time in quite a while. We talked about this on stream and I've wanted deep dish pizza and I'm sad that all restaurants are closed. Uh, get it delivered from Lou Malnati's house of pies. <laughs> they do frozen <laughs> delivery, man. And it's good. It like, works. <laughs> Lou Malnati's house of pies. I'm not joking. That's okay. what it is. It's okay. like Lou Malnati. Like, that was a, uh, like yeah, a, I thought a it was a teenage dirt bag. <laughs> it's both. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can get uh deep dish pizza wherever you, whenever you want, man. Okay. Um, they just ship it to you straight in a fucking virus sleeve <laughs> from the factory. Okay. All right. Um, I will take your word for yeah. it, man. It's fun. It, it's ex well, no, no. Order it. Need it. Okay. Don't take my word for it. It's good. <laughs> uh, it's expensive, but it's also like You're, deep dish pizza is a lot of food. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, a, a it's it's real dense. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, the proof is in the eating. Okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. Good shit. Um, Popo for, for, for show show says, I think Ocarina of Time really pushed how the clunkiness of the Nintendo 64 or how the clunkiness of Nintendo 64 games could put a damper on a game with a decent wireframe. The Water Temple was a creative use of 3D space, but the menuing for the boots was so tedious. The hookshot was empowering, but aiming was a nightmare. Z targeting was genius, but enemies blocked constantly. I love this generation of consoles, but as every year passes, it's harder to come back to it. Yeah, especially as you play other stuff that is kind of more competently, competently implemented with better control schemes, with better fidelity, um, yeah. and just with less clunk overall. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah. It's, you know, like, and if you're going back specifically for clunk, you know, see our Kingsfield fascination, that is A-OK -okay and fine because, like, there could be, you know, like, and there is special stuff there. But as a general proposition, like, I don't know, who's going to go back and play Shadow Man? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Let, let Shadow Man die in the past. Yeah. So, yeah, yep. Agreed. Um, Rodrigo says via contact, back in 2000, I was six and my brother was two. Neither of us uh, read at all, and my father barely knew any English, and the three of us played uh, Ocarina of Time a lot. Every weekend, we rented Ocarina of Time. Uh, cartridges were expensive in Brazil, uh, and prayed uh, no one deleted our save. Uh, my father read the game for us, and for some reason called Ganondorf as Gandafor and Hyrule as Hydlure. Yeah, 
just uh, transposing some letters. I love I, it. I don't think Gandalfor is worse than Ganondorf. Yeah. You know, uh, four is a better suffix than dwarf. <laughs> so, <laughs> We're taking a bold phonemic stance stances yeah. here. <laughs> our anti-dwarf bias has been at the, the <laughs> heart of all of our Zelda coverage for the entire show. Yeah. Dwarf. Dwarf. Go to hell, dwarf. Dwarf. <laughs> uh yeah, that that is a that's a great. I love. Yeah, I do not really miss uh, renting games and hoping nobody erased your saves. But like, boy, time's fucking weird. <laughs> that that factors <laughs> into a few of the responses. I, I I can't recall how many more of them got in. But like, we're gonna we're gonna talk about that as a, yeah. a as just kind of a general a general factor of people's OOT experiences. A rental market. Yeah. Uh, Eric says via contact. Uh, Ocarina of Time held the title of best video game for me and my younger brother for a very long time. When we were young, I remember my brother asking to play on my save file once I had reached the Temple of Time. He made a beeline for Lon Lon Ranch and spent an hour riding around Hyrule Field as Epona. Ocarina of Time was as much an Epona simulator for him as anything else. Ocarina of Teens. <laughs> teens. The, um, <laughs> no. uh, years Later, when his apartment was broken into and our old Nintendo 64 was stolen, I rushed to the internet to buy a replacement console, controller, and Ocarina of Time cartridge and shipped them to him immediately. I still pat myself on the back for being an A-plus big brother that day. P.S. My brother is transmasculine and just got top surgery. Thank you both for being so supportive of the trans community. That's awesome. Congratulations, Congratulations. to your brother. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Hell yes. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, th that, that couldn't have been cheap, buying uh, N64 and Ocarina of Time. <laughs> I, like, I thought you were still talking, you were talking about the surgery. No, no. I was like, where I, are you I going mean, with this one, Cole? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 like, the, the, only, the only point that I would have to make for it is that procedure would not have been cheap. And it should be, uh, both for general healthcare reasons, but also yes. identity and life affirming uh, procedures. Absolutely. Be who you are. It should I be accessible. Just, the, yeah. Because you said it with the confidence of talking about buying a Nintendo 64. And no. Like, oh, Cole's talking about top surgery with the confidence of buying a Nintendo 64. <laughs> oh, we got it. We got it. What gotta, happened? You like, like, Get, 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 ready, on? get ready for the markers there no, i have no idea yeah. I, I i can only imagine that's costly but no i was i was more talking about the more talking yeah. about the, the, yeah. the ocarina of time cartridge specifically i, I get it now yeah okay in retrospect <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. uh. oh man um what does uh oh wait that, that, that this is me uh zero dark thoughty writes via contact saying well not my first nor favorite zelda game zelda one and a link between worlds specifically ocarina of time means a lot to me that said i really enjoyed hearing your fail fair analysis of the game uh that was neither too rosy nor outwardly antagonistic I personally tend to prefer this middle period of Zelda Ocarina of Time through Twilight Princess. The now familiar dungeon structure of Ocarina of Time just works for me, even when individual elements of said dungeons fall short. I'd rather engage with a well-defined, purpose-imbued play space like the Water Temple than traverse the blind, sparse, and dissonant world of Breath of the Wild. Despite blind. it... Uh, what's up? You said blind. Oh, <laughs> bland. Sorry. <clears throat> no, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, then traverse the bland, sparse, and dissonant world of Breath of the Wild. Uh, despite its offer of relative freedom and a noted lack of loathsome fairies. Anyway, I love the app as always, and I'm excited for Luigi's Dress Me Up Adventure. I mean, Luigi's Mansion. I, I get through Luigi's Mansion. I wasn't able to dress up Luigi one. Uh, so I don't, I don't know what that's referring to. <laughs> yeah. Luigi was, was like a, a real footnote to my adventure because I didn't play co-op. So I did not get a lot of Luigi. Yes. Good. Um, uh, that had to have been something that they added in for the 3DS version. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Luigi's. Uh, uh, speaking of things that look wet, <laughs> I don't care for. <laughs> like, Luigi's really one of them. <laughs> And of course, Guiji came out. The internet was all like, "I'm gonna fuck that." It like, drove me nuts that day. <laughs> like, really horny for Guiji because it's the internet and it's Fucking Twitter, stop. and people are people are gonna want to just go into everything, and it's their prerogative. Because but how would you even fuck a Guiji? I just, I mean, how couldn't you fuck a Guiji? It's nothing but give. But that—that's why you need. You need push back for a proper fucking. <laughs> I, <laughs> like, just, yeah, go um, tell you're telling me you never you know you never got got busy with the Jello mold. Jello, yeah, <laughs> you never fucked Jello. You're telling me you never stuck your dick in a pudding cup. 
now who now who's <laughs> now who's not here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other the other part of this, uh, it's interesting, like, so there's been an unending and will never end conversation in the Slack uh, yeah. since we started talking about Ocarina. And that, uh, you know, this bit about, um, you know, I want to be in that play space. It doesn't, you know, even if the individual elements fall short, um, like the grand unified theory of Zelda that I, doing that episode has made me come to is that Zelda is all about synthesis yeah. of individual elements and those kind of coming together. And like, that's always a part of video games. You know, but I think that the thing that puts me off of mid-period Zelda is the fact that a lot of the glue, as opposed to being those individual strong elements, is music and art. Yeah. You know, it's that adventuresome tone rounds up a lot of things mm-hmm. uh, in a way that doesn't particularly is not particularly workful for me. Yeah. Um, and I think that um, by the time Ocarina came around and was such a hit, you know. Um, I mm-hmm. think that it established such an identity that they rolled with for so long that there was going to be a backlash when they decided to um, veer away from it. For as many people yeah. who looked at A Link Between Worlds and, and thought, oh, my God, thank you. I can just re- I can just rent the hook shot. Sweet. Yeah. You know, like like that, like that was a good idea. There were people who bucked against that. I mean, I, c- kind of for like comfort reasons. Like, are you looking at a Zelda game? as something that is comforting or are you looking for it as something that will kind of grow and match with the times? Right. Yes. You know? So like I can see people who feel, you know, I could, I can understand why people would feel betrayed by breath of the wild because it is a different, a different thing that is not going to go through those different movements. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the, the dungeons are not going to roll out in the same particular way. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, let's see. This is me for Sam or it's you for Samuel. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll go ahead and read it though. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think it's me. Yeah. Uh, Samuel says, I've noticed how it is, uh, trendy to point out the shortcomings of Ocarina of Time after losing its sacred cow status, especially compared to its quirkier sibling, Majora's Mask. But for a generation of console kids, this was our gateway to immersive Sims. That moment for me was during the great deco tree while exploring the upper floors. Previous Zelda games had taught me to look for keys by using items and killing monsters, but I had checked all the upper rooms and even tried to shoot the web on the floor with no luck. My naive dad said something like, try jumping onto the web from a ledge, because he didn't understand that in Zelda, you kill monsters to find keys and open doors. Right. I even climbed up to the top and jumped off to show him that it wouldn't work, but to my surprise, I broke through and landed safely in the water. <laughs> At that moment, I didn't feel like I was playing a game, but I was in a world that had a game in it. Admittedly, in hindsight, these moments were few and far between, day and night, uh, secret caves, etc. But chancing that rush would lead me to find games like Deus Ex and System Shock a few years later. Yeah, yeah that's it, cool. It was wise of them to put that particular puzzle um, in the first dungeon, one that specifically mm-hmm. uses the fact that this is 3D. You know, yes. and, you know, that falling matters and, you know, falling matters in a different way here than it did before. Yes. Yeah. And I just want more of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I, I recognize that as a cool moment. Yeah. I just wanted, you know, significantly more. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, like the, the, <laughs> it is specifically because that is so cool that, like, it's really disappointing when you get to the ice cavern and you're picking up the, uh, the silver rupees in order to unlock mm-hmm. stuff, right? Like, yeah. just one of those things is integrated and the other one feels very, very artificial um, yep. in a game that so far has, uh, you know kind of prided itself on feeling a bit more naturalistic you know even yep. if it is artificial in hindsight exactly yeah so <clears throat> Uh, let's see here. Mike writes via contact saying, although Ocarina certainly wasn't the first 3D game I ever played, I distinctly, re- I distinctly remember it being the first one to use 3D space in such a way to sell a sense of scope and continuity not really possible in 2D. Particularly, that experience of walking out into Hyrule Field for the first time grew to feel monumental mainly because all of the silhouettes I could see in the distance. Because of all of the silhouettes I could see in the distance. Uh, The castle, the ranch, Death Mountain. These were places that I could eventually go to. Although that's obviously less significant now, uh, it can still be used to powerful effect. How cool was it in Firelink Shrine to gaze off into the skybox and see all sorts of places that you could eventually explore? Uh, There's a sense of wonder and discovery that can come with a really well-designed 3D world. I think it's a waste of energy 
to determine who did anything first. But Ocarina of Time came along during that period in the mid to late 90s when the industry was still figuring a lot of the stuff out. And that is why so many people remember it as such a major benchmark. Other Zelda games have aged better, and you guys aren't wrong to judge it through a modern lens, but I'll always love it uh, for doing what it did when it did it. Mm. Yeah, for, there's there's no uh, there'll never be an argument for me about whether this is uh, something that is noteworthy and like innovative. Yeah, monumental. Yeah, yeah, like and and that that's one hundred percent true. Mm -hmm. I just like you know the the episode and all the the criticisms and stuff I had about it were entirely reckoning with the fact that I had almost no no fun playing it. Yeah, and you know it, it kind of comes down to like that is you know there and it, it's it's huge, but when you're sitting down and actually putting your hands on the sticks, is it enough? And yeah. it's kind of not, it wasn't for me. Like you can yeah. choose whether it is. Oh yeah. That's, you know, for yeah. you, but that's it. Yeah, for me, it just like, wasn't enough because every moment to moment I was doing stuff that I was tedious and frustrating Yeah, uh, for basically a thing. So like, it's very hard for me to reckon with just not having fun in a game that is designed to be fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not, this isn't pathologic. Like everything about this game is communicating to me that I should be, experiencing joy mm -hmm. and i just wasn't yeah you know it reminds me of like um <clears throat> like to to put it in my home court right like as opposed to picking on consoles or or things i tend to pick on like i've never gotten through or made very much progress into wasteland yeah yeah right wasteland <laughs> codified so much about what i love about video games mm -hmm. like wasteland is, is so incredibly cool yeah uh i don't think it's fun to play i find it really really frustrating right uh, system shock one Mm -hmm. I ha I can't really play and <laughs> it, it did a lot, right? but it just doesn't matter because I don't have any fun mm -hmm. playing it really, you know, yeah. and everyone's going to be different in that respect. And Ocarina yeah. is on the other side of that thing to me where it's like, it wasn't a death march to get through it. It mm -hmm. was, but it had a lot of slog qualities. Yeah. So, um, any, any good and honest analysis of Ocarina of time would be able to draw the line between the, you know, the Hyrule field reveal through to uh through through to firelink and the stuff that's cool there uh just like any good and honest evaluation but also um be pretty frank about the mechanical failings in a modern in a modern play and you may notice that i sound different uh now that i'm uh coming back in we are experiencing technical difficulties with discord probably due to plague but we're so close to the end we're just going to scoot through so apologies yeah. uh and uh let's, sorry yeah sorry uh we will continue but that, that is a uh, well-observed point mike mm -hmm. uh moving on to fenriliana uh, via contact. Uh, Ocarina of Time, like all my Nintendo 64 games, was bought by my mom at a garage sale secondhand. The Nintendo 64 was my first console at age six and my first exposure to the concept of video games. So when I peered into this polygonal alternate world, I was quickly entranced. But I had no vocabulary, no trained reflexes, no understanding about what games expected from me. So making progress in any of them was entirely arbitrary. I likely wouldn't have made it uh, escaped Kokiri Forest if it wasn't for one important detail. This was a pre-owned game and time when saves were stored on the cartridge my fondness for ocarina of time doesn't come from solving puzzles or comprehending the story or watching the medium evolve into a new frontier no my fondness comes from loading different save files and just going for a walk seeing what new areas i could see and being terrified of facing them playing my ocarina and wondering if i could find a secret hidden song poking at the edges of the game as far as i could tell was a limitless possibility for a kid who couldn't comprehend the plot of even a simple movie i fell so deeply into the atmosphere and it fired up my imagination and ways that nothing else did it might be irrational it might not be satisfying but ultimately i love ocarina of time simply because it feels like home to me that's a that's a big thing actually the importance of ocarina of time for a lot of people as a just a, a, a fun and meaningful world to exist in especially mm -hmm. if, it, if it was an early experience for them that was a thing for me too you know, you know like it was just kind of fun to be in hyrule right yeah um you know like it you know it's hard to communicate if somebody was not there and it's, you know, especially hard to communicate here, just kind of like talking about it a little bit in our, at an arm's length, which is, which is what we end up doing. But like, I don't know, like it was, a, I can understand why it's satisfying, you mm -hmm. know, like I would never, I would never like, I would never uh, forfeit the act of playing this, you know, or the, you know, <laughs> forfeit the fact that it was satisfying back in the day or like, you know, nostalgia is real. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, you're not made of stone. Yeah. 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 I agreed. Yeah. Uh, what does Matt have to say? Matt has to say, 
Uh, I have a strange history with Ocarina. I was seven years old when this game came out. Ocarina seemed really fascinating to me at the time, but honestly, I was too young to figure it out. Uh, I also didn't get to buy a lot of games back then, basically only for Christmas and birthdays. So most of the time, I had to rely on renting. My lack of experience with video games combined with only being able to play Ocarina for two to three day rental periods meant that I never played it in the traditional way. Every time I rented it, I would have to start from the beginning again, uh, which was fine by me. I loved just running around, cutting grass, and getting rupees in the starting area, which I would do for hours. I don't think I ever got past the Deku tree. Uh, the weird thing about rentals at the time was that other people rented it uh, and would have their saves still on the cart. Uh, so I would see the other files on my rental of people uh, at the end of the game and jump into their save. Let me tell you, this is a real wild play, a real wild way to play a game when you are seven years old. Jumping between my save, cutting grass, and Kakariko to Hyrule Castle as adult Link uh, with all of his items was surreal. I remember being so confused what the heck is this place why am i an adult now why is my tunic red uh i'd really like to go back uh, to this game with adult eyes since i have fond childhood memories of ocarina but never actually played it i guess i'll wait for the inevitable switch port crusty's coming right this, this will definitely go on switch at some point oh yeah 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 uh so crusty will be there mm -hmm. uh for you yeah that's uh, i i like uh rental times stories yeah happened for me uh, that was the uh, the way that i beat final fantasy 4 originally mm. there was just a there was just a save file uh that had um that had every you know that was up up on the moon <laughs> um, and, like i loaded it up and like I, I think that i played that before i even got to um oh gosh got to the point where you make the transition from dark knight to paladin oh yeah so you got to see a different character you know <laughs> yeah yeah and like they changed the names which is a psychotic thing to do so i had no idea that like that that, that cecil was cecil like it like i was like hey where, where's my guy i thought the cecil died that's in really a neat. way he did yeah in a way he did <laughs> yeah. uh the a weird like modern corollary to that is like the nintendo switch online how they do oh, those yeah. versions of nintendo games where it's like at the last boss with all the items those are so good it's such a I cool love idea those things. yeah yeah that's great uh, that's kind of the experience <laughs> of picking up a rental cartridge and loading up an end game. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, David says via contact. I will never forget becoming adult link at the temple of time and finding my world twisted into a nightmare. It's all too perfect. It all too perfectly reflected the path of my own life and the death of my childhood. Yeah. Uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of Ganon, I wear a green skirt and a weird hat. Through the shrieks of undead that were once my neighbors, uh, even though that instills a sense of nausea and existential dread, I will collect four bottles and fill them with Kool-Aid. Surely horse friends and asexual feminine archetypes will comfort me, for Miyamoto is with me. Uh, things have not gone well taking this proclamation into the real world. I think I have the coronavirus, <laughs> and I'm getting uh, suctioned for exposing myself uh, to zombies when their high-pitched shrieks startle me at the local Walmart. I keep playing <laughs> the Song of Time on my automaton, uh, but I never get back to the good old days. I'm stuck in a mm. bad hole. My world opened like the rosy fingers of a maid and closed in the shape of the valley in the shadow of Ganon. That was very poetic. Grim. I... I butchered it because i'm off my rhythm it, because of technical shit yeah yeah you also didn't expect somebody to come in and you know do no, yeah, it's... bible verses <laughs> right yeah no it's uh the, 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 that is the uh that is the other edge of nostalgia mm -hmm. is uh you know you're kind of going you're going back to the uh to the thing yeah but you're also revisiting the person you were at uh when, when, when you first came to it yeah james says via contact praise uh, you're both beautiful, good boys, and I want to scoop you both up and make you happy forever. Thank you, James. I would like that. Thanks, James. Second, <laughs> I was so happy to hear that you're covering Ocarina of Time. I'm slightly younger than your usual demographic, uh, and I was five in 1998 when I got this game. Uh, do you know what Ocarina of Time does to a five-year-old? It ruins the five-year-old. That's what. <laughs> <laughs> it sent me on an embarrassingly long GeoCities hunt for the Triforce uh, that could never be obtained, but those are still some of the best memories I have. Uh, they say that every Everyone's favorite Zelda is whichever one they played first as a kid. 
But as an adult consuming game, I can see the consuming games. I can see the faults. Janky controls, a fairly sparse story, and the Water Temple. But I can never separate it from the abject wonder that I experienced it with. I played it with my mother, who was a longtime gamer, and remember her picking me up from kindergarten, absolutely ecstatic that she had finally figured out how to get into Jabu Jabu with that damn fish. What with the nascent internet being no help. I imagine a lot of people will have similar feel-good stories about this game, regardless of the general consensus about how it's aged. Please buckle up, because I will now explain in detail the entire timeline of The Legend of Zelda. Just kidding. I can't wait to hear your thoughts. I know all those. you said all those nice things at the beginning, but explain that Zelda timeline to me is a good way to get banned. Don't do yeah, that. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I appreciate good, you. You're very nice, but good, please don't do that. It's a good joke. Yeah. It's a, yeah. <laughs> but, but don't do it. Yeah, no, no one ever told yeah. me about this all the timeline. Um, you're all freaks. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you need help. <laughs> like, I appreciate you, but come on. Um, yeah. It's a, you know, gather rosebuds. Uh, <laughs> that, is, that is a sweet story. Yes. Yeah. I just, uh, I, I, man, there's something about it. I love, I love stories of kids playing with games with their, with their parents or with their family, mm-hmm. brothers and sisters and stuff, especially if it's tied up with nostalgia like that. Uh, that'll be a, uh, that'll be a shortcut to my heart every time. If you ever get sick and I edit the responses, it's only going to be stories about deadbeat dads and stuff. <laughs> I'm going to change it so it's exclusively misery zone. <laughs> Sorry, uh, man. Ocarina of Time reminds me of uh, the fact that my family is shit because Link has no parents, just like me. And, <laughs> like, good insight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, like, well, Jared. Um, uh. Charles Andre says uh, via Quebec, um, it's pretty much useless to state how much Ocarina of Time means to me. It's been a part of my life from childhood to today. I used to be absolutely terrified by the final fight with Ganon. Many times I would get all the way there, but as soon as the beast rose from the burnt ground of the castle, I would either shut down the N64 in a panic or run to hand the controller to my dad. <laughs> Too many years later, the old Nintendo 64 is now living what its well-deserved retirement at my parents' summer house on the lake. A group of friends and me decided to go spend a week up there this summer between university semesters. We bring a few ounces of weed and a full sheet of LSD. On the second day, we drop the acid and wait for it to kick in, so I turn on the console and there is my old save. I proceed, oh, I proceed to go through the castle, the entire castle with a huge smile creeping across my face. As the castle is crumbling, I can feel that sweet tingling sensation in the top of my head. Everyone's watching, and by the time Link stabs the beast in the head, I'm fully crying and laughing. There's cheers all around. As soon as the credits roll, we all run out of the house, jump in the lake, and proceed to have one of the best days of our lives canoeing and exploring for hours i can happily say that beating ocarina of time on acid was one of the most fun times in my life man drugs sound really fun <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, i uh you know just uh imagining myself in the same situation rocking in the corner in the closet talking about how dragon <laughs> quest hasn't evolved enough for my taste <laughs> like, while weeping <laughs> <laughs> So, oh man that's a good story yeah that's awesome. very good that is great <laughs> that's how that, i mean that i mean so i imagine that yeah, so the the untold part of any venture with hallucinogenics is and then i spent like three hours vomiting uh likely <laughs> yeah. yeah but you know the idea of being in a canadian being being at a canadian lake house and then just jumping into the you know beating a game cry weeping and then jumping into the lake and exploring mm. and stuff sounds it's so fun to me. Yeah, that sounds nice. Uh, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Good story. Mm-hmm. Uh, Micah says, via contact, and this is our final response here. My first experience with this game was going to a friend's house and watching them beat the final boss. They had the bigger on sword and all of these cool items and was obviously adult Link. There was the enigmatic staircase with the organ music and Zelda shooting light arrows. It was enough to make my eight-year-old self scream in delight. I got my parents to rent it for me, and to my dismay, when I brought it home, I was started out as child Link. The opening of the game was a slow descent into disappointment, culminating in catching a fish in a lake or something and watching a fat fish wiggle his butt for two solid minutes. Um, I bounced off in the middle of Jabu Jabu's belly. It was all too disgusting and I felt cheated. Where was my adult Link in all his glory? Bigger on sword in hand with gadgets bursting out of his lime green tunic and Zelda posing behind him with a light arrow notched into her bow. 
It wasn't until years later on the Wii that I went back and finished the game. It was fun, but alas, the magic was gone. I was too old. So, it will always be second fiddle to Majora's Mask in my memory. There's something to, to be said about um, the curve of, like, getting stuff to play with in these games. Yep. Mm-hmm. You know, and balancing that pretty perfectly so it is it is fun on the way. Yes. Because uh, cause the, the, the toolbox, the full toolbox feeling of a Zelda or a Metroid is really important to the mm-hmm. fun of those games. And starting with the to- full toolbox would not be... I mean, you, you get Link Between Worlds. I mean, yeah, you often yeah. do. It's like a yeah. thing about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, having it for, for the game, you know, not necessary, mm-hmm. uh, necessarily the best practices. But onboarding mm-hmm. you too slowly or giving you the peak of that and then taking it away can be very frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. You know, combined with the generally slow opening uh, mm-hmm. compared to, like, the, the climax of this game, which is dark and intriguing and action-packed in a yeah. way that just it is not until you become adult link really mm-hmm. yep, yep. yeah I, I i can see you feeling like you got a you know you were you were sold a bill of goods you know mm-hmm. 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 yeah yeah um yeah so thanks everybody thanks you for your responses um again apologies if we didn't get to yours if we mm-hmm. edited it or we cut it for time uh we still yep. would like you to write in um if you have things to say about april's games which Mm -hmm. are Luigi's Mansion, Legend of Grimrock 2, Prince of Persia, The Sand of Time, or Wolfenstein, The New Colossus. Uh, Mm -hmm. Hit us up at duckfeed.tv slash contact. Yes. Um, And if you have thoughts about maze games, um, not maze games like Pac-Man, the games for the month of May, uh, the deadline for that is going to be May the 15th, and we're going to announce what those games are now. Yeah. Uh, So these are the games. Um, It is uh, sponsored by JerryCon. Uh, mm-hmm. Hypnospace Outlaw. God, I'm so looking forward to this. I played like the first chapter of this game. It's so good. Yeah, I've not played it. I'm really excited though. <laughs> so, really good. Very excited. Uh, so it's yeah, it's kind of like lots of indie stuff this month, even though the the premium is not indie. Yes. Yeah, uh, because the second game is a beloved game from a couple of years ago, Celeste. Yes. Uh, this is a premium game by uh, Nyasa. Uh, I do not know how to pronounce the rest of that name, and I do not uh, wish to try. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so apologies for for mispronouncing that name, but when we say premium game, we mean it is a, a pick, a, a produced yes. game, yes. Um, for that. And then for mm-hmm. our premium episode this month, surprising, hopefully no one, uh, mm-hmm. we're doing the Resident Evil Three remake. Yes, uh, so. this is kind of following in the footsteps of us doing the uh, RE two make last year, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, shortly after it came out, we're just we were going to play it anyway, and people are going to want us to talk about it, so we're just kind of swinging for it. Yeah. Uh, my the only the only thing that I am upset about is that it is not that episode isn't coming sooner. Yeah, but <laughs> uh, every once in a while we treat ourselves to a brand new game. You know, yep. and if you don't like that, we just did Ocarina of Time. It's 23 years yep. old. Um, the <laughs> 22 years old. So the uh, every once in a while, we want to do something pretty new. Yes. And uh, yeah, but I'm really looking forward to that. That's going to be a good month. Next month. Mm-hmm. After that's very interesting. Uh, we'll, yep. we'll talk about that. Um, yeah. And we got other cool stuff. If you want to uh, sponsor an episode, you can do so through Patreon. Um, if you want to get those premium episodes, you can do so through Patreon as well at patreon.com slash TV. The other thing mm-hmm. you can do is leave a rating or review on Apple podcast. That is very appreciated. Yes. And I think that's probably about it. Uh, I think so. Um, so we've been mentioning this a couple times, but we do have video content that we are doing. Uh, mm-hmm. We alluded to it earlier. Uh, you can go to youtube.com slash TV. There is both public facing content like Gary's Darkest Dungeon playthroughs. Uh, we have my uh, kind of quick looks at horror games and archives of my streams. The uh, Bonfire Side Chat Rewind series that I'm doing. And we just added a premium kind of short run series uh, for patrons where we are doing uh, kind of dueling Dark Souls randomizer runs. Yes. Um, yeah. And those are available at the uh bonfire side chat tier uh you want to get a hold of those at the five bucks yeah yep. so uh plenty of plenty of things to do we are not going to abandon you in times of quarantine and plague um because you know i don't know we need something to do anyway it's true. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah uh but uh there, there's there's plenty of us for you here yeah absolutely so we appreciate you and we will see you next week with luigi's mansion yeah um be kind to be safe <laughs> <laughs>